Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. And we're here to talk about race, racism, ladies and gentlemen, and why it's stupid. Some of you don't think it's stupid. Prepare to be schooled by this expert squad we have here. All right, let's uh, let's go around the the room here. We have first of all, we have John McRae. Yo, whatever, everybody. Hey, John, John I noticed McCray. you're black. Yeah, I am black. All right. That makes you an expert. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. All, I'm an expert on all things right and all things white. Hey, John, you started moving all slow. <laughs> you started moving all slow again as soon as as soon as vocab messed with everything and started uh, sharing screens and stuff. Oh, man. We'll see if that we'll I'm... see if that changes up in a little bit. All right. Then we have vocab Malone. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, Vocab? What's up, yo? Um, well, my name is Vocab, and I look how I look because I'm part Sicilian. And growing up, that you, gave me a very, you look very like, interesting you look like, background. You look like a dork because you're part Sicilian? That's messed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, whenever I hear a comment like that, I always go up to the person and I hug them because I know it's very difficult to go through life visually impaired. <laughs> <laughs> all but, right yeah all right and we have uh we have adam coleman from the true id apologetics channel tell everyone hey what up what up introduce yourself a little uh adam hey y'all know what it is man your hometown hero the real adam coleman you know what i'm saying john mccray speaks for all black people but i'm like i'm like the vice uh, expert you know what i'm saying I'm, I'm second in command bro so i'm, I'm following <laughs> your lead john I got you, bro. All right. Now, the the, the reason we the reason uh, we we sort of put together this live stream was Adam and Vocab and John all posted a video about Nick Cannon and the uh, the things he was saying in his. Uh, I guess that that live stream was that live stream that he did. Or well, that wasn't even. I don't even think that was live. Uh, the podcast that was recorded was like from a year ago or something like that. But um, they all posted a video on it. And I said, gosh, you guys all posted a video on it. We should just go live and talk about some of this stuff. So we're going to be talking about Nick Cannon. We'll be talking about some of the other issues like, uh, you know, the Redskins renaming their team, uh, Land of Lakes, tearing down Confederate statues just to get everyone's thoughts. So we'll be sharing our views on, on those issues. And you guys in the chat can share your, uh, share your comments on these as we're going along. And maybe we'll pull up some comments and discuss them. Um, but uh, who wants to talk about... Well, first of all, first of all, um, on the issue of racism, it seems like there are kind of two extremes. There's, there's, there's people who say that, you know, there just is no racism or or that that it's completely insignificant it doesn't affect anyone's life uh and then on the other extreme you have people who just kind of see it everywhere like everything is racist every you know everything you see all around you is uh racist uh any any thoughts on that yeah i think the first question is going to be like what is racism because when i whenever i'm talking about racism i realize that everybody's always on different pages when it comes to what racism is. So um, some people define racism as just prejudice against like another person's skin or are feeling superior to another race based uh, or uh, to another person based on their skin color. And some people define it as prejudice plus power, uh, which is kind of a more common um, definition. A lot of times, um, like it's actually a scholarly definition in, in some uh, circles. So it's like you have to have prejudice and pl power in order to be racist, which is why some people will say that black people can't be racist, only white people can be racist. Um, so you get into all that and stuff. But I think, yeah, that, I think the first step is understanding what racism is, then is racism towards people or is there institutional racism? Is there a racism on an individual level or is there institutional racism? So I think understanding those things usually help the conversation go forward. Yeah. And uh, so, 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 so one, there, there is the, there is, you know, what do we mean by racism? And then, and then th there's another issue, namely that there are degrees, right? There's, Hey, my race is superior over yours and you need to be subjugated to me. And then there's, you know, then there are, you know, there are shades all the way down on that. There's, hey, you know, I don't have any problem with you, but, you know, you ain't going to be marrying my daughter or something like that. You know, you have right. you have different uh, you have different degrees. Uh, Adam, what, what what are your thoughts here? Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I think what you guys are uh, hitting on really 
taps into what I, what I believe is probably the biggest problem that we're seeing within the church and why a lot of conversations amongst believers don't really go anywhere is because I think that we're allowing people out in the world to define and frame these issues and then we're trying to address them from a biblical lens rather than starting from biblical axioms in terms of you know what's going on in the world and building from there. You know what I'm saying so you got all these people who have these, you know, you know, we're letting sociologists, economists, and everybody else kind of tell us what's going on rather than saying, okay, well, let's start from the biblical worldview. What does it look like to value somebody else based on, you know, them being made in the image of God? What does it look like for somebody to divert from that? And then kind of, you know, start from those kind of biblical axioms and figure out what's going on. So I, I agree with John. I think that there's a lot of, you know, different ways that people use the term racism. And it's like, you know, it kind of gets jacked up. And, and I mean, to your point, you know, it, <laughs> I, I say it all the time, like, you know, just because you're not like riding around on a horse, you know, burning crosses in somebody's yard <laughs> doesn't mean you're not a racist. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think that people think racism, they think, yeah. OK, well, I'm not Bull Connor. Therefore, I'm not a racist. Whereas you can still have your you know, ideas and thoughts, you know, staying with racism and just not be, you know, maybe malicious in that sense or, or, or something like that. So, so yeah, there, there's like these different degrees that, you know, because people aren't taking those things into account, we just end up talking past each other mm -hmm. a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, Hindu historian just commented, uh, my aunt and uncle didn't even attend my cousin's wedding just because the groom was black. Now, mm. hey, Hindu historian, are they, so are these, uh, are these Indians? And I mean Indian, Indian, not like Native American Indian. So, uh, Hindu. See, we're we're going to talk about the Washington, you know, Redskins in a minute, man. You're already messing up, yeah, we bro. Are. Come and on, we, man. We, and like... we, we have comment. We have comment. We have comments on that. So Wade Wilson here said, "I'm Native American. The Redskins were warriors. That is admiration. It wasn't racist. And that's one of that's one of the things we're actually going to be talking about here in a few minutes. Is that, you, you know, that that team was named the the Redskins because people pick." warrior names for their teams you know it's like the the vikings the vikings or uh the trojans or the spartans or something like that nevertheless nevertheless the term redskin even though and again we'll be talking about this that the term redskin originally was just you know there was there was black skin white skin red skin in in order they didn't use um they didn't use technical terms to apply to the different races. They just referred to even even Native Americans, uh, at least in some areas, would refer to themselves as as red, and so wasn't originally, you know, a derogatory term. But it kind of took it kind of took on derogatory connotations over time. And so now we're in a place. Now we're in a situation where a lot, a lot of people do find it a derogatory term. And so what do you do? Do you, what, what do you do? So a couple of, you know, a couple issues. One, is it, is it racist or is it derogatory? And two, given that that's how it is used now, what do you do about it? What do you do about past, you know, things that were named in the past? Do you, do you change them now? So we're going to be talking about that here, uh, here in a minute. Um, vocab, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on what we've been, what we were just talking about before we jump into some specifics here? I would, uh, think, uh, racism, is a violation or or a committal of the sin of impartiality, and you know the or the sin of partiality, where wherein you you make some kind of partial judgment based upon some kind of external uh, factor in which one person for whatever reason is determined to have more worth or value than the other. Uh, a great place, of course, in Scripture you see this laid out is is in James. And uh, and I, I think I said sin of impartiality. It's the other way. It's sin of partiality because you're showing partiality based upon that. Uh, I think uh, Paul's instructions in Philippians two three uh, are all equally applicable to this. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. So the the biblical perspective is is literally the opposite. And uh, I got a good quote here. Uh, from a commentator that says this on Philippians 2.3, If anything in our whole life is difficult, this above everything else is so. Hence, it is not to be wondered if humility is so rare a virtue. So it's 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 an undue pride in something about yourself versus over and against someone else. For as one says, everyone has in himself the mind of a king by claiming everything for himself. See, here is pride. Afterwards, from a foolish admiration of ourselves, arises contempt of the brethren. So I like that that phrase, though. We have a foolish admiration of ourselves. And last part of this quote I'm going to read, And so far are we from what Paul here enjoins, that one can hardly endure that others should be on a level with him, for there is no one that is not eager to have superiority. 
And that's the end of that quote. And the commentator that I quote there from is John Calvin on his commentary to Philippians. So I wanted to start off in a very strong way. No, so you, you want bring, you want bring it up. You wanted to start off by pushing your Calvinism on everybody. Uh, well, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Because that's the, only, that's the only true superiority, that Calvinist Christians are superior to all others. That's right. the only true, justifiably biblical superiority. But, but with, Yeah, Vocab with, likes that man-centered doctrine, huh? With well, Calvin. Well, I think, well, I think Christianity I think, didn't exist until Calvin came along. Go ahead. Only one of us quoted the Bible. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, uh, bringing it back is it's the sin of partiality based on ethnicity it's a sin of partiality based on sort of a tribalism writ large mm -hmm. and uh so therefore it is a sin you know actually i, I do want to add on to that though so I, I think one thing that this kind of brings up an important but i'm not going to dwell on it too long but i guess one of my kind of pet peeves is i think that this concept of racism <clears throat> i think it has what we can call essential properties to it, and then you have some properties that I think aren't essential. And so, what I mean by that is, I think you've got to have some sort of, you know, like, like you said, partiality going on. You know, there's going to be some level of just being unloving towards somebody on the basis of race. I think those things are fundamental to being, you know, a racist or, or you know, exercising racism. With that being said, I think some other aspects of like, I don't, I don't think you necessarily have to see yourself as being actually superior to somebody else to, in order to be a racist. I don't think that's an essential property. I know some mm -hmm. would disagree with that, or I don't think you actually have to hate somebody. In order to be a racist, you could not have some sort of emotive disposition towards somebody and yet still believe, you know, some things that are erroneous about that person on the basis of race, you know, um, or like you know, to, about the superiority. You might not think that black people are or, or what, some other race is like ontologically lower than you. But you might just not like them, <laughs> I'm saying like for, for some, on some other basis. I'm saying that. So I think that sometimes you know what what muddies the waters about discussing race is that people make certain things that, in my at least in my view, I understand this. It's, it, everybody wouldn't agree, but they make things that aren't necessarily essential properties of racism, uh, an essential property. Uh -huh. Yeah, like uh, yeah, that sounds like muddy in the water. Yeah, me. like uh, like you have <laughs> right? uh, you have uh, you have groups that are like um, you know you have like white separatists or white nationalists who. Right believe that white people are superior and therefore need to be isolated so that their you know their their gene pool isn't polluted by inferior races you also apparently have black separatists who believe that you know that blacks need their own area and so that they're not they're not polluted by uh inferior inferior genes but you also have i've seen people who aren't thinking in terms of like this group is superior to that group they're they're thinking a, a, like almost along the lines of like aesthetic terms like uh you know you have these different groups and if you mix them all together then you don't have the, the different groups right and and so you need to preserve all these different groups otherwise everything just gets mixed together and everyone loses everyone loses their identity so i i've seen uh, i've seen those people but uh you know what what's what stands out more are the are the uh you know the, the the ones who who say that this group is actually better and therefore you know we can't have our our gene pool tainted by by other people like like i get that my 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 wife is half asian and i i've actually gotten messages david you're a disgrace to the white race because your your wow. wife is half asian it's like but i, I what i want to what i want to point out here is how everyone's kind of being i feel like everyone's being manipulated on this because if you are some sort of separatist or, or racist this is kind of your last stand right now because if you look if you look at the change that's been taking place you go to our grandparents generation and you were it was illegal in the united states to marry someone uh, from another race that law eventually changed that's why my wife's parents my wife's parents were able to get married they were able to get married because they changed the law and then a white man could marry an asian woman so they got married and now they had two daughters one one daughter married me the other daughter so my wife's sister she married a man who's half black and half white so his dad i mean uh his yeah his dad is black and his mother's white and so anyway the point here is just just the generation of our grandparents it was illegal 
to marry someone of another race. You get down to the grandchildren of that generation, and now you've got three you've got three different races at the at the family cookout, right? You've got black, white, Asian all at the same family cookout. That's how rapidly this has taken place. So if you are some sort of separatist or <laughs> some sort of racial nationalist or something like that, you understand. 30, 40 years from now, everything's going to be so mixed up, it's, it's going to be impossible to make your case for some sort of, you know, you know, splitting everyone up after that, right? You're going to have, you're going to, you know, 50, 60 percent of the population that's being born are going to be mixed. And so it, it's, it's kind of now or never. And so you have to just, you have to, you have to make race the essential issue of this time in order to kind of push uh, you know, push this. And so the point is, there are all kinds of different voices here. Some some people have good motivations in pushing this issue, and some people uh, not not good not good motivations. All right. You know what's interesting about that though? I just just kind of throw a little nugget in there. Um, I don't know if I have the book uh, with me right now, but uh, Frederick Douglass, in one of his later speeches, a lot of people don't really talk about it, but in one of his later speeches, he was answering the question of what is the future. For the black race and interestingly enough it's not even a long speech it's like it's relatively short and he actually makes the same argument that you did is is, is that really the question is in some sense irrelevant because in a relatively short time according to him there really won't be any black or white race because the two races will end up mixing and it's very interesting he says something he said that that is basically going to be like how the phoenicians were now i don't know if this is actually the case but he depicted the phoenicians as being some sort of like a mixture between different races in ancient times and he was saying that here in America that he believed it was going to be the same way. And that would actually be the end, end up being the resolution of the whole race problem, so to speak, um, in the um, excuse me, overall. And I guess in, in some ways he kind of looked to himself um, because he, he was half black and half white as, as well. And in later later on in life, he actually ended up married and marrying a white woman. It was his, his second wife was white. But, you know, I just think it's kind of interesting to your point. It's been a relatively short time that. Um, that interracial marriage has been legal. As a matter of fact, I, I went to school with the grandson of uh, the, the Lovings of uh, the Lovings. Now the Lovings were that was that um, Supreme Court case uh, where you had the, the the white man, the black woman who got married, and so on and so forth. I actually went I actually went to school to high school with their um, with the grandson. Mm -hmm. And we used to call him Snoop because he kind of looked like Snoop Dogg. <laughs> you know, so but it just I just said that to say it wasn't that long ago. You know what I'm saying? I went to school with that with that kid. You know what I'm but saying? Yeah. Well, my grandma is white. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but I have a, a white grandma who's actually British. My dad is from London. Right. And so, like, there's all kinds of stories about how hard it was to, like, you know, coming to America and stuff like this in the race. And then they finally got married and stuff, too. And there's I got a lot of stories from, like, my family and all the segregation and stuff. Even my mom grew up in our, my mom's family from Louisiana and then all the separation there and stuff. So, yeah, it hasn't been that long. You know, 1960s wasn't even that long. You know what I mean? When a lot of this stuff was, um, you know, when. Um, Martin Luther King and all that too. So yeah, it hasn't been that long, but um, yeah, let's just keep going because I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to slow down. All right, so we uh, we sort of decided to to uh, have this live stream because everyone was was posting a video about Nick Cannon. Now, guys, I have to I have to ask here. All three of you jumped on the black guy as soon as he said something racist, <laughs> huh? And what is that? Is that not itself a kind of racism? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Speechless, <laughs> speechless, <laughs> busted. Yeah, I'm about to block y'all now. <laughs> I'm about to, I'm about, to I'm about to turn I mean, off I'm, Skype. I'm gonna be upfront, man. I, I'm, I'm gonna be upfront and tell you exactly why I did the video because for me, it's a matter of consistency. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think people, you know, for me, I don't want to have a platform where people are watching me and I'm, you know, either being hypocritical or or just inconsistent. So for me, if if I see something, I'm gonna call it out. I don't care if the person's black, white, green, or whatever. It's all about consistency. You know what I'm saying? And and I think that what we see in the public square, and I'm not, I'm not calling anybody out by name, but I think what we tend to see is that individuals feel more comfortable calling people out who aren't so-called on their team. Mm -hmm. you know, they want to call somebody else out on somebody else's team. But as Christians, I think that, you know, going back to, you know, vocabs, you know, the, we don't want to be exhibiting partiality. You know I'm saying we got to call a spade a spade and let that be what it is. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, you know, I, I'm I'm very serious about like I, I want the black community to do well. I'm saying this is a, a, a the context that God has sovereignly sovereignly placed me in, and I don't want black people imbibing ideas that are harmful because ultimately it'll destroy the community. So when I see uh, influencers 
or intellectuals who are pushing certain ideas to the black community that are ultimately destructive, I'm against it. I'm saying adamantly. Here's someone in the uh, live chat on that. Uh-oh. It says, uh, racism nowadays is a black thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, John and Adam. What's up there? So, <laughs> well, here's, a, here's the thing. Why are you guys hating on me and Vocat? It's a real comment here in the live chat. You I'm know? logging off right now. You know. it, yeah, and people will disagree with me on this, but like the way I understand racism or the way that I conceptualize it, just as a very practical level, is feeling superior to another person and not liking that person based off of their, their skin tone. And I know that's probably not a sufficient definition for some people, but um, if that's the case... Yeah, I think that racism goes both ways. But some people disagree with me on the view of racism. They think you have to have this power and all this to enforce racism. I just don't, I think that that definition gets circular and stuff like that. So yeah, I would say that yeah, there are black racists. I think that the, I know black racists. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I'd say that you can be black, uh, black and racist, white racist doesn't really matter. And I agree that pushing a lot of the narrative sometimes, if we were being consistent. Um, then, yeah, it looks really racist unless you have some sort of definition that might appear ad hoc or might be a different kind of definition to excuse it. But, yeah, you see a lot of that. Yeah, guys, uh, that, that might be a helpful video by someone here. It, it, I'm, it's probably already been done, but it really hasn't been popularized. But l- l- come out with like four or five names for different kinds of racism so that people know what you're talking about. Because if the problem here is equivocation, Right, that the people are changing the meaning of the term depending on the conversation. Then it make it makes sense for some someone to say, "Oh, he's a racist," and someone to say, "What? What are you talking about? That, that person is right. not a racist because that person, blah 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 blah." Um, and so, if we if we come up with different different words, this is a such and such race, a type one racist, a type two racist, a type three racist, a type four racist. This person is not a type one, two, or three racist, but he is a type four racist or something like that. And then explain exactly, exactly what is, what is meant that might, uh, it's, it's like that video you did with the cops, you know, where you kind of describe you got, different, you got different kinds of cops, officers. man. You got those, right, you got right, those, right. Yeah, you got those I mean, cops. and to John's point, I mean, I agree. I, I think I, I get, I understand why, the the kind of the prejudice plus power definition is, is kind of you know grab, grabbing hold today because i mean you, you do find it in the literature but at the same time i think that our definitions and concepts should as best we can describe the things that we're pointing to and i don't think that the prejudice plus power concept really describes what it is that most people are pointing to when they talk about racism mm-hmm. i think most people when they're talking about racism it, it does have to do with somebody's personal inclinations or uh, of, you know one way or the other and if that's if that's the case, then any individual, any person could be racist. You know what I'm saying? Now, with that being said, actually in the in the title of my video about Nick Cannon, I, I use the term rather than saying racist comments, I said racially bigoted mm-hmm. comments. Because I just didn't feel like having to deal with going back and forth with people on whether something was, was racist or not. Right. So I use I use the term racially bigoted, you know, just to kind of get around that. But you know, yeah, I I agree. Okay, so sort of to start getting in on some of the specifics we want to address, um, who wants to tell us basically what, what Nick May, uh, John, do you have something on, uh, can you pull up something on the claims that Nick Cannon made, just a couple of quotations for him, and then Vocab, you made a video sort of going through why, where he's getting this stuff from, so maybe, we, and then Adam, you can you can follow up with uh, with Vocab on, on where, where some of these uh, ideas are coming from. Uh, John, you got some stuff there? Yeah, um, it's hard to find articles of a lot of quotes. Um, there was an article, though, from the Daily Wire that had, like, a lot of kind of partial quotes and stuff, and I can just look at a few things, but the article is called uh, Nick Cannon, White People Are a Little Less Closer to Animals, True Savages. <laughs> I just pulled out those. <laughs> All right. Um, so it says, uh, speaking on an episode of Cannon's Class, the television host argued that melanated people have a natural sense of compassion and soul that white people lack, creating jealousy and fear that causes them to act out in evil ways. Man, that's not entirely Correct, but um, we can talk about that. It says, when we talk about the power of melanated people, he said on the program, um, melanin is so powerful and it connects us in a way that the reason why the f- uh, why they fear black is because they lack, is because they, is because the lack that they have of it. Uh-huh. Um, so we can just stop there for now. If you guys want to talk about that point. So no, notice, one, the, the kind of scientific absurdity of saying that soul <laughs> is contained in melanin and therefore the more the more melanin you have, the more the more soul you have. Uh, kind of, kind of a 
Like, like if you were to ask someone, go ahead and def- go ahead and defend that, right? Go ahead and go ahead and locate the <laughs> locate the soul part of the of the melanin, right? Like, like show us what experiments have confirmed that. I guess all you can say is. Well, look, I'm, I'm assuming this is how he's thinking, right? Look at, you know, look at musicians and, and all, of, you know, come on. Yeah, you got you guys got Eminem, but come on, right? Um, <laughs> something well, like- actually, he, I think he's associated with like kind of like some sort of camaraderie. Mm-hmm. I think it, from what I recall, like he was trying to attribute it to how we got love for, for one another, you know what I'm saying, as black people, which, you know, listen, I, I try to keep it 100 with in every show. I mean... I, I love my community. This is why you yeah. know, guys are signed for the place me. But I mean, let's be real. Like, I mean, I've been held at gunpoint by other black yeah. people. So I mean, you know, I, I didn't. I wouldn't but, feel in the soul. <laughs> no, but that, that's that's a good point like, though, because the reason why that's a good point is that's one thing that non-blacks probably don't realize is that whenever you see a black, this is what's cool about the black community though, because whenever you see a black person somewhere, you always say what's up to the other black person, right? Yeah. It's like that, right? Like, and so it's kind of cool, but it's funny because whenever I see white people, I'll go, and when I see black people, I go. <laughs> <Time enough. laughs> no but but that is a thing though is like um black people at least in the community they feel like they're united um by um you know by being black in the struggle and all that or whatever so that um that's where the community idea kind of comes from too and so i think that's what he was kind of getting that too but well l- let me let me uh jump in here if mm-hmm. i may so a few things one is there's actually a whole grip of literature and uh, YouTube videos that are all from a pseudo-scientific perspective run, run around the Internet and, and before that as well um, within the so-called conscious community. And um, I know personally a friend who went to Baruch College in New York who took a, a certain uh, studies class in the ISIS papers was assigned as part of his college reading. And the ISIS papers was quoted heavily in this discussion and part of that um is is found in that book and i want to actually read i have the transcript in front of me the specific part they're talking about because it's important to understand it and i mentioned this in in my video and i don't remember which parts you use john about this but when we see centuries in western context and just can say in america context focusing on that centuries of white supremacists from subtle to overt ways through every facet of society beating down on those and creating this hierarchy with wasps at the top and those of African descent at the bottom. This is what's been hammered through thousands of different power structures from the media to the economic system to where you're allowed to live. To It's a long, long list to, to rules about politics. Uh, to certain crimes and their related infractions and, and punishments. Now, w- within all that, you have the, the pendulum swinging the other way. And very rarely, when you do that, do you land in a place of balance. And so there's this reaction to that situation. So that's trying to have an empathetic view, I think, of the situation, of the kind of stuff that Griff and Cannon are saying, but not originating. They are repeating people prior to them. And a lot of what they're saying, people don't realize, is actually very, very common within these these circles that they would listen to and, uh, in some cases, traffic in. Now, I'm going to read the quote, and when you hear it, understand, and I got this from Nefer Nitti, so shout out to her, subscribe to her, but it's helpful if you understand they're essentially viewing melanin as a superpower. That's a that's a that's a kind of a, a quick way to understand it. Now here's the quotes. Uh, so Cannon says this. This is 48 minutes and 18 seconds in. So then let's go to what it really is. Then, so he see this is a, a part of the root issue. Everyone, when we talk about the power of melanated people, when we talk about who we really are as gods, and understanding that our melanin is so powerful and it connects us in a way that the reason why they fear black. The reason why they fear is because the lack that they have of it. So Adam mentioned some of that. Continue on. So then when you see what Dr. Francis C. Welsing talked about is that fear in that, and they kind of talk past each other at that point, the transcript has. And then Griff says, is genetic annihilation. And so understand, you have to understand the perspective of the community experiencing this stuff, 
not just in their own lifetime, but when they hear their grandparents and great grandparents, if they were fortunate enough to know them, speak and when they read. So it's personal, it's public, it's every aspect of your existence, right? They're trying to essentially explain what, why have white folks been so evil to us? Because it, it seems inhuman and indeed treated inhuman in many ways. And so what happens is it's almost like we need to explain how this could be. So it's almost like some kind of strange, not theodicy, but you understand mm-hmm. what theodicy is. It's, it's some kind of thing like that. And so different theories get postulated. Mm-hmm. And so this is a reaction to that, and this is one of them. So it's almost uh, sympathetic in a weird way. White folks have acted this way because they're simply doing this to survive because they know they will experience genetic annihilation if they don't do this. Now, this is the main quote I'm going to read, and then I'm going to pass it on. I just want to really get to the kind of the nitty-gritty of what they really said, right? When you'd have a person that has the lack of pigment, so I'm continuing quoting Canon here, the lack of melanin that they know that they will be annihilated. So therefore, however they got the power, they have the lack of compassion that melanin comes with compassion. Melanin comes with soul that we call, we call it, we're soul brothers and sisters. That's the melanin that connects us. So the people that don't have it are a little, and I'm going to say this carefully, and I'm going to pause right there. I almost feel bad for Nick Cannon. The brother's about to say something wild, and he's like, I'm saying this, this real carefully right now. I'm going to say this real carefully, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm treading easy. Now this is what he says. And I'm going to say this carefully, or a little less. And where the term actually comes from, because I'm bringing it all the way back around to Minister Farrakhan, to where they may not have the compassion or when they were sent to the mountains mountains of Caucasus, when they didn't have the power of the sun, that was that the sun then started to deteriorate them. So then they're acting out of fear. They're acting out of low self-esteem. They're acting out of a deficiency. So therefore, the only way that they can act is evil. The only way they can, they have to rob, steal, rape, kill, and fight. And then Griff says, fight or flight, okay? In order to survive, Cannon finishes the sentence. Now, understand, if you really pay attention to what's being said, there is some pseudoscience even in there. Just like Superman, as a native of Krypton, draws his power from Earth's sun, and that's why he's even able to resurrect it to being killed by Doomsday, in essence. Similar with black folks and their relationship to the sun, and white folks who don't have that relationship with the sun. So melanin has all kinds of advantages, that you you have to understand. Now, understand, I am speaking from their perspective. I'm not saying this is rural. This is junk science. It's pseudoscience. There's all kind of mess-ups in this whole insane thing. If you want to really understand this in, in a five-minute version, there's a rapper that was that was popular among the underground lyricists back in the day named Raz Kaz. Sometimes people call him Raz Kaz. R-A-S space K-A-S-S. He had a song called The Nature of... Is a, is a lyrical screed that embodies a lot of this and will help you understand uh, this kind of idea. So, like, I was listening to Raz Cast way back in the day. My point by saying that is I was exposed to this kind of stuff all the way back, almost all the way back in middle school. Not that I'm some expert, you know, there's always some new popping off. But you kind of see this, and so that's part of what's going on. So I think it's helpful to try to have an empathetic view about why why is someone talking this way? And before you get all wacky and wild, and because someone already said in the live chat, they're totally wrong. Racism nowadays is a black thing. I, I It's so shocking to me somebody would say that. Like, like did they, I mean, I'm just going to mention one, but did they forget the very real issue of a man in Texas being dragged around in a truck until he disintegrated? Like, th- this is not the only example. I just named a particularly heinous one. Did they forget about that being specifically racially motivated? I mean, then we could go on from there and backwards and forwards and look at all kind of examples. Like, what are they talking about? It wasn't long ago that white folks, to prop up their racial superiority, were delving into pseudoscience as well. Mm-hmm. The size of the cranium, for example, all kinds of reasons that they would give. And guess what? If you go on some of the Christian identity websites, KKK apologist, they still delve in this kind of thing today. So I said it wasn't long ago. It used to be more mainstream. We actually had evolutionary scientists jumping into this saying, well, look at this, right? But it still exists, albeit in a lesser a lesser uh, known way. John McCray's disappeared, by the way. Yeah, uh, uh, let's just see if we can hear him. Hey, John, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I can see you guys. We lost, we lost your video. 
He, right, is, he is the invisible man of the book. What'd you say? What'd you say, John? No, I said I'll, I'll try to figure it out real quick then. Get back okay, uh, sh should you hang up and call back, or how's it work? Uh, no, I'll hang on real quick. I'm gonna try to restart my video. Okay, uh, cool. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Say too, like, yeah, like I mean, and, and less people think that uh, vocab is being extreme as far as uh, describing it as a superpower. Um, that, that's not an exaggeration. Like, I mean, you know, folks who subscribe to this ideology. Now, granted, there's there's various different levels that not everybody is a monolith, even who. You know, some, some people subscribe to the broader ideology, but maybe not some of the specifics. But if you listen to the end of, I think it was somewhere towards the end of this interview with, with Professor Griff, Professor Griff mentioned something about astral projection, and he associates that with melanism, uh, me being melanated. And so it's this idea that given the level of melanin that we have, we can, you know, like our souls can leave our body and, you know, travel and, and do all sorts of things. Some people even take it that, you know, we can get in, in tune with the deepest parts of the universe and, um, you know, uh, and contact aliens in some cases. I mean, there's all different kinds of views associated with, with uh, this melanin. Some folks will even actually, actually I think that um, there was this one clip where Professor Griff said something about like, like picking your hair out or something like that. Now, that might be getting two interviews mixed up. But some people believe that you know, Afri you know, black people's hair is actually like an antenna, you know, that is yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. No, no, he does. Into... He it does. Was, that was interview. Yes, right. yes. And he, he, he. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a total. Let you finish. I'm sorry to Kanye West, Taylor Swift, you. But it's exactly. He's talking about a brother who feels like he's in a messed up state of mind, and Griff is gonna like bring him back to a proper point of balance. And he says something else too. Yeah, there's a pick out your hair. He says something else physical, but I forget what it was. But it's a, It was this idea of sort of naturally relocating yourself as a per person of African descent. That's kind of what he was essentially getting at. And right. so you're exa it was in this interview. So this is all very real, uh, very real connected. So it's directly related to perceived properties over and against others. And sort of the more you have of it, essentially the better off you, you are and will be, and the less you have of it, the worse off. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, here's what's interesting. So, I mean, to your point about, um, about Nick Cannon, I, I do think that, I, I mean, obviously, he's done a lot of business with white people. I mean, uh, his platform clearly, you know, depends quite a bit on, on white folks. So, I mean, on this one hand, you see him kind of being pensive, kind of being hesitant about saying what he's about to say. And yeah. then he comes out and says, yeah, you know, uh, you know, white people are, you know, are those who lack melanin are a little less. But, it, that is, but it, I, thought, I find it interesting he didn't say, like, a little less what? Like, what do you mean by that? Like, a little less, uh, you know, on the human hierarchy like like what do you, what does he really mean by that i feel like he kind of left something out there and it kind of really shows how um um uncomfortable he was but there's there's like a couple and I, I don't know if you have any clarity on this uh vocab but you know a lot of times what you'll see is you know these folks who say you know like white people came out of the caucus mountains and you know and like he was describing you know, with like these animalistic ancestors and so crawling so. crawling on all fours yeah i mean a, a lot of that goes on right you know, but one thing I thought he said it was interesting. He said when when they were sent to the Caucasus Mountains, yeah, I that am, was interesting. I, I banish, banish you, you. <laughs> right? I mean, it was, it was, I thought that was very interesting because normally, from what I've seen, I could be wrong, but normally I think that that the idea is that white people either migrated from, you know, uh, I mean, migrated to they the emerge. My thought is they emerge out of them while while there's this state of of black supremacy and pinnacle of civilization happening. White folks are uh, not using anything proper hygiene, scratching each other's backs, eating their defecation, crawling on all fours, and they emerge out to see the sun and this massive black culture and realize, dang, Timmy, we better get on the ball or these folks are gonna genetically annihilate us. <laughs> <laughs> Timmy? <laughs> yeah. It's Neanderthal wrong. named Timmy. <laughs> You know, but but no, but but here's what's interesting though. So now I'm kind of now I'm I'm trying to fill in the gaps, just just trying to understand the moment, right? So what we what we have to know is that Professor Griff is you know has strong leanings with the NOI, mm -hmm. strong leanings with the NOI. I mean that, that's kind of his thing. Now I'm sure he's he's kind of eclectic. He's taking on other ideas, but along with that, the NOI has has for a long time taught, and in my understanding, I think even Farrakhan still believes this, and what's called the y Yakub theory, the Yakub theory. Is this idea that about six thousand years ago, uh, some like basically a mad scientist created white people? Didn't that dude have? Didn't that dude have two brains? Yes, yeah, actually, I have heard that. Yeah, I mean, now, I don't know if that's always present in that, the myth. But that's I mean, that's, I'm that's that, the one I heard from the five percenters in prison. That white white man was created by grafting some 
uh, right, stuff from right. a two a two right. a two brain scientist, and some some would even say, <laughs> some 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 of them said that the white man was created by a two brain scientist who grafted the skin of a pig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean that's to true, create the, to create a white man. I mean, out of it, that, that's true. You just said that's true. Oh no, I mean. Uh, I mean <laughs> <laughs> Take that little clip right there. Adam's career. Adam's career as a as a Christian apologist is over. I mean, it's but really, the thing, of, people said the it, thing but, about yeah. all of it is that like um, it all boils down to truth, right? And that's why like I like First John and stuff too, because he's always talking about like uh, where we're kind of unified and stuff like this. We have fellowship with each other and God in truth, right? And if, so like that's the whole thing. Because what struck me, what kind of weird about Nick kind of thing, because he sounded like a lot of conspiracy theorists to me. Like a lot of conspiracy theorists kind of take the same path, but he actually was following the logic a little better. The thing that was wrong was all of his fundamental premises. You know what I mean? But if his fundamental premises were true then you could get to those conclusions but it's just so absurd because his his foundations his axioms were all out of whack you know and absurd so um yeah anyways i think that's why we need to be lovers of truth as christians 1991 uh you had farrakhan come out with a book uh and i think it's like a trilogy at this point the secret relation relationship between blacks and jews and in 91 you had um your your guy. Well, actually, it came out before ninety one, but ninety one is when it was known to a lot of media because that's when uh, Ice Cube actually endorsed it. This is a little mini miniature refutation of of the book series, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. Um, but the reason why I bring this up is because if you listen to the entirety of the interview, Griff says, back in eighty nine, I got an advance copy of the relationship. Uh, the secret relationship between blacks and Jews from the in, in the nation of uh, Islam, the research department, right? And what happens is he went to Kinko's and made some copies of it. And then he had an interview. And what happened is in that interview, he s repeated a lot of the things out of this book. This is my general understanding of the timeline from what he said in the Canon interview. In 1989, that got Griff kicked out of public enemy. Now, I mean, you know, all due respect to Flavor Flay, but I think he's a crackhead, right? <laughs> he's been kicked out of Public Enemy a whole bunch of times. They funny. keep on having him. It's funny because that's exactly him. what I was thinking about. I was thinking, you know, wait, uh -huh. you keeping a crack? Right. <laughs> you keeping a? Right, hang on. You're keep, not, not just a crackhead. You're keeping. You're keeping a crackhead in a Viking helmet. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what I was, but he but he knows what time it is. So you know he he, he keeps on coming back in, but Griff is kicked out. He's never brought back in, right? Mm -hmm. Ne never at all, and so like you gotta you gotta kind of understand that uh, the public enemy Griff is gone forever uh, from the stuff that he said that that was uh, you know anti-Semitic. In which in the interview he did say Jews are responsible for the majority of evil in the world. That's that's what he said, right? That's among amongst other things in this '89. So it's it's ironic Griff is on with Cannon again now in the year 2020, and basically the same kind of thing happens. But Cannon has now repeated ideas that since then have been f have been filtered down through the Internet that are actually considered common wisdom amongst large components of the conscious community. That's what's so fascinating. So now Griff is like this guy back here with this pre-published book, right? Now in 2020, Nick Cannon's like talking stuff with Griff that he got from everybody, everywhere else on the Internet. So we got to understand, like, kind of what's happening, what's going, what's going on. And so that's why their conversation is a massive mixture of syncretism of all these different alternative urban spiritualities, including Nation of Islam, including general ideas in the conscious community, comedic science, including some pseudoscience from pseudo academics as the ISIS papers, for example. I mentioned, I mean, there are science college reading in some places. And of course, Hebrew Israelism is in there as well. Uh, you can even hear it at the end of the interview because hey, Professor Griffith said something like, you know, um, uh, I want to say Nick Cannon was thanking him for being on. And then Griff was like, nah, man, you was dropping jewels, man. You was dropping jewels. And I think that Griff was probably, and I'm, I'm not trying to get too far into his psychology, but I'm thinking he's probably thinking, like, I don't know where the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I can say or what I can't say, you know. And then so when Nick Cannon is just going in and calling white people animalistic savages, and Griff was like, oh, it's that kind of party. All right. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm kind of thinking that was the kind of vibe. But then interesting, too, I thought was what I think is interesting about that is that you have these different reversals, if you will, packaged into Nick Cannon's statements. And what I mean by that is so, so when he says um, he, he, he didn't say, all right, you know, um, uh, you know, white people are animalistic. He said white people are, are actually the ones who are animalistic. 
I'm saying so like so what so why did he phrase it that way? It's because for so long, going mm-hmm. back to like Carl Linnaeus that I talked about like in, in, in my video that I dropped, you know, you had the scientific racism that in, in played a huge role in the uh, perpetuation of the transatlantic slave trade. And part of that was this idea that black people were savages, they were animalistic, and so on and so forth. And that's, that uh, idea's been around. And so Nick Hansen, no, actually, white people are the ones who are, are animalistic. You know what I'm saying? Again, going back in the day, you know, it was this idea that Europeans were, um, you know, I guess the originators of, of uh, you know, civilization and so on and so forth. But then Pro- Professor Giff says, no, it's actually black people. It's all that, that flipped on its head. Sin. Right, right. You I mean, know, it's, it's gave, funny, you know, Adam. Look, listen, reverses, to, there's, you know, I mean, there's it's very interesting. Someone in the comment section, I think, that is repeating a version of that idea. Listen to this. Tell me what you think, Tony Hodge. Yep, Farrakhan is a fraud. Okay, we could agree on that part. Both, but we, I don't know about this part. Listen to this. Both the Sumerians and the Egyptians claim to have genetic, genetically modified whites, but they were unruly, problematic. Oh wait, wait, hold on. Is Tony uh, Hodge that's, saying? That's interesting. It, I, wait, at first I was reading it like I thought the person was saying that the Egyptians were genetically modified whites. But here it makes it sound like he is, he, Tony is saying even though Farrakhan's a fraud, it's still a fact that whites were gem- genetically modified and unruly. Because after that it says, look up Tamahu. That's what they called the whites. Okay, so this person is actually repeating some of the ideas. So there's a pseudo-history ah, there as well. Here's, interesting. here's what's interesting. That's, that must be a comedic because the term Tamahu – you actually you'll hear Brother Jabbar use that term a lot when they talk about white people. He, when he talks about white people, he use the term the Tamu, and I think it means like the northern peoples or something like that. Oh, okay. But notice what he said is that th- that these different cultures created white people, but they got unruly. And see, that's consistent with what Nick Cannon said about them being sent to the Caucasus Mountains. It's not that they <laughs> just go to your room. You see what I'm saying? Like so go to your room, little Timmy. <laughs> apparently, this person in the chat is buying into the ideas that that Nick Cannon was. Uh, was was advancing, but I mean this is obvious nonsense. They, they, put obviously... on, they put him on a racial timeout. Oh, did they? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm saying oh, like no, the, 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 they banished yeah. to the caucus mountain. Yeah, like, on, they were go sitting. to your room, little Timmy. You know, learn how to behave like the rest of us. Actually, this is all very true though, because what the Nation of Islam says is actually sort of a uh, reversal of the classic white man's burden. They think it's the job of the NOI to civilize society, and the most difficult creature of all to civilize. The devils, mm. Mm. The, the white folks in, by, inherit by nature. And again, people have to understand where these things come from. That doesn't excuse how bad or backwards they are. It's helpful to understand how things arose. Because I see um, – it's easy to have a simplistic view of stuff, right? I mean it's very easy, but it's helpful to understand – where ideas come from, and then you can understand why there's resonance with said ideas. This is very important in apologetics. So some people in the live chat understand you're like, well, let's just have this simplistic view, and I don't know about all this. And You're just not going to be a good apologist. That's cool. These conversations probably aren't for you because that's not really what I'm trying to do here. I don't you know. Uh, well, I mean, it goes back to, I mean, I think you know, John's point about there, there's some internal consistency in terms of what Nick Cannon is saying. Like if his fundamental premises are true, then he's articulating something that's consistent with his premises. The problem is his fundamental ideas are false. You know what I'm saying, and therefore everything that follows from that is false. And, and that's that, and that's that's apologetics. It's pointing those kinds of things out. And, and by the way, that that's that's also that's just how pseudoscience works, right? That's how, how pseudoscience really gets off the ground. Is uh, hey, I see this difference in you know between these two things, right? So there's there's this group and there's that group, and I see some differences here. Now let me attribute it to this other thing. And if you agree with that, if you say, yes, that's the source, well, guess what? You've just explained the evidence in front of your eyes. And therefore, you run out and you push that that theory that uh, supposedly explains things without really performing science, right? With Without really performing some some experiments to see if that actually uh, uh, is the explanation for things. All right, guys. Um, David, what, what, what? David, whenever we ban racist on uh, the channel during today's chat, can we, <laughs> can we say... Go to the caucus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mountain. Yeah, you can banish. Yeah, you can banish racists to the caucus. <laughs> to the caucus. Yeah. Whenever we, because I see one here right now. Nikki Mutok says the coming savior is all white. With fiery eyes. <laughs> there are people literally repeating this stuff in the live chat, like they believe it. <laughs> you're, you're a mod dude. Do what you got to do. But you can, yeah. And you, but make, make sure you use some cool echo effect or something like that. But actually, on that, on that issue, on that issue of like, you know, and this, this. This ties in with vocab a minute ago talking about a, uh, a racial timeout. Um, and then you have the, the issue of, you know, banning people and canceling people on this issue, right? So Nick Cannon said some messed up stuff. 
right? He said some messed up, silly stuff. He talked about white people. He talked about uh, Jews. And so the question is, once someone has done that, once someone has, has done that, what do you do? Because the inclination, whenever someone says something that's a uh, racist or racially bigoted or something like that you just have to crush the person into silence you know make sure the person gets fired from whatever his job is and i kind of get that with someone who's like a public figure like you know it's it's kind of hard to to keep someone as you know the host of your television show or something like that when you know you're going to be getting all this all this negative feedback for that person but at, you know at the same time i, I kind of think Getting people fired and crushing them into silence doesn't change their views. It doesn't do anything to alter their views. It just forces them to be more careful and to keep 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 things on the on the on the DL a little bit more. So I I I'd almost like You're to Nick Cannon's on the DL, man. Is that, are you accusing him of being a down low brother, man? Is that is that what down low? Use I don't know how you use it. Back in the day, we just use it. You keep something quiet, man. You got to keep it quiet. <laughs> quit quit perverting everything, man. <laughs> So I read it mine. Now check this out. Uh, so anyway, what, what I'm what I'm saying is when someone actually when someone actually comes out with claims like that, before you try to crush that person and end his career and cancel him and he, he's just done, I, it's like I'd, I'd like to see a little a period, a little window of time, right? Like, okay, Nick, we want you to we're, we're going to have like a public discussion of your views. We're going to bring in a couple a couple of experts on this issue and people who've who've done research on this issue and we're going to get you on stage with a couple different perspectives and we're going to talk our way through these things. You're going to make your claims, you make any claim you want and we're actually going to go through these things and we're going to see if that's where the evidence actually points so that people who are watching can make a, a better informed decision and and a less emotional decision. I I'd, I'd much rather see that, but it just seems like no, you have to crush everyone that you disagree with. And again, that doesn't change anyone's mind. If you were if you if you were watching Nick Cannon and you said, I agree with everything this man says, and then you see people crush him, that's not that's not a refutation of his claims. I mean, if he's claiming that the Jews control the media and then he criticized the Jews and then he gets crushed, that didn't change your mind. You're like, whoa, they got him. Whoa, they got that's him. He, Charlemagne yeah, said. Yeah, he's right. Charlemagne Martin. said he can get in canned as proof the the proof of what he so said. Right is, there. So that's no. true. No. No. Well, I mean, so I got a slightly different view on it, and I haven't really thought it all the way out. So I'm just gonna throw it out there, and we can just kind of see what we think. What we think about it, but like, say, like capitalism from a capitalistic standpoint, right? If you got two businesses that make widgets, you know, and business B makes a better widget than than business A, then the idea is that. Either you know, b business A has two options. I'm saying the more people in the market that are buying from business B, either business A can you know switch it up and make a better widget, or they can die out. You know, and people are just not going to patronize them anymore. You know, now it, what if your your widget is your persona, your your or is your ideas? I'm saying if you're if you're a person who has a platform, and basically your your business is to market yourself and your ideas. Then in the market, if you if those ideas are not, you know, well received, if people don't want your ideas, then they're no longer gonna patronize you. You see what I'm saying? So like from a capitalistic standpoint, it's it's basically hit, you know Nick Cannon calling people savages and so forth is the equivalent to business A making bad widgets. Mm -hmm. you know I'm saying like nobody's running around buying Daewoo's anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm saying like for like for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Buying so, what? Uh, exactly. A day we was a type of car like 15 some some years ago. It was, it was basically garbage. Not, you know, from my understanding, nobody's. I don't think they, they exist. Oh anymore. yeah, 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 yeah. It's like uh, jokes. Jokes come out of that. Like, uh, what's the difference between a a Daewoo and a Jehovah's Witness? Uh, you can sh you can shut the door on a Jehovah's Witness. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, I think some people like when, we, when we're talking about people who have public platforms. And if their ideas are not something that people want to consume any longer, then people will stop consuming them. In the same way that if McDonald's to start, you know, they're serving horsemen, they're not going to buy from them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, yeah, just one, think, that's just uh, one perspective. I think the the culture, that cancel culture idea does actually stop um, people from being able to think through, think things through, right? So that's what makes it a problem is because like now people don't know how to think through any of these issues because mm -hmm. if they say something, they're just going to get shut down. And so if we did have an ability where people are allowed to say these things and then they have the debate and the discussion, then people would actually be interested. So like you, you always have the fear of like, 
bad ideas winning, right? So like say Nick Cannon's idea is like taking traction. But the way to combat that is like if people are taking it seriously and they're emotionally invested, then you can have some really articulate responses and then people can, you know, look for both sides. Because I don't mind when people say a bunch of stuff that I don't like, like, or say, but call me racist stuff or whatever like that. I'm more okay with it if we can have a conversation, you know what I mean about it? Because then I, I, I don't really mind. I don't really care, you know, in that sense. But uh, the problem is, if like, you know, I can't voice my views or they can't voice their views. It's like, um, like with Candace Owens and all that, like I did the video talking about it, I don't like the way she approached the stuff, but I'm happy that she gets to be able to do it because then I can actually see both sides of it and then think it through for myself and see, okay, what do I align with? You know what I mean? So I think that's the beauty of free speech. You take that away, you got problems. Yeah, guys. And, and, and so, yeah, I agree completely. What, what I think that I think the issue is everyone thinks, oh, here are all these views I disagree with and we have to silence these people. But that's just forcing people to be so nervous about actually vocalizing what they believe that their their ideas are no longer in the open marketplace where 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 people can you know actually go through them criticize them and see if they stand up to scrutiny so the the idea is the more people are trying to cancel each other and the more fearful people are of of uh subjecting their views to scrutiny the more these radical ideas are going to be circulating because you're just going to you're just going to share them quietly you're never going to subject them to open room. scrutiny yeah. or open open public debate and so you just keep them keep them kind of quiet and form your little group and you discuss them on platforms where no one can see what you're actually talking about and stuff like that and then uh and 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 then yeah so so they go without without challenge all right so let, let's let's move on to a slightly uh well well a, a different topic here uh before we uh, go on to a, another couple of issues black lives matter this ties in earlier to when we were talking about um, uh, when we were talking about how how racism is used equivocally, right? It, it can be used in different ways, and so people aren't sure when someone says, "Oh, that's racist," they don't even know what someone else is talking about because that person might have a different view of racist and and racism and things like that. But here's a here's a perfect example of that. Uh, John Millick says, "Should I, as a white man, support Black Lives Matter?" To be honest, I don't even know if I can consider myself white since Eastern European isn't the same as Western European. So here's a, here's kind of the, a similar issue, namely Black Lives Matter can actually mean a couple of different things. So when we ask whether you should be supporting it, you should kind of be clear on what exactly your what you know, which BLM you're talking about. So, uh, uh, Adam, what do you th- what do you th- what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, no, a- absolutely. I mean, I guess it depends on what the person means by, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. Now, I will say that, um, you know, the, the proposition, mm-hmm. Black Lives Matter, I think obviously so that's, articulates that's one meaning. That's, that's one meaning, a proposition, the claim, a proposition. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Right. You know, the claim Black Lives Matter is obviously, or I shouldn't say it's obviously, maybe it's not obviously everybody, but it's objectively true that Black Lives Matter. And I think that people understand why, you know, it, um, that notion has been articulated is because it, it um, to many of us in the black community, it appears that some people don't believe that black lives matter. And so we feel the need to, to make that known. Now, l- l- let me clarify something real quick. You know, well, actually, let me say this first. L- let's distinguish that between the proposition and the organization, black lives matter, mm-hmm. as in the black lives matter movement that has the websites so on and so forth. Now, obviously they were the ones that coined the phrase. Um, now the black lives matter movement, um, whether you're white, black or whatever, I don't think anybody should support the organization. And the reason why I say that is I, I, I would challenge everybody in the chat right now. I'm gonna give you some homework, right? Go to the Black Lives Matter page, click on the What We Believe tab. You will see an affirmation of transgender. You'll we see an affirmation make, we make of mother. Space, we, make we make space, space for space. transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. Uh huh. Now, here's what you won't see you won't see not one thing amongst their, uh, their what they believe about black fathers. Not a one. You won't see anything specifically affirming black males among their uh, all all the. And I, I want to say that that the gender stuff is mentioned like five or six six times throughout their their tenets. Not one time did they affirm black fathers. Oh wait wait wait. Hey, very telling. There is a one way in which they would affirm parents for black fathers is if they transition. <laughs> Oh well, <laughs> we are so reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift right. black trans folk, especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans anta- antagonistic violence. So that'd be the one exception. 
Right. <laughs> there you go. So they try to dismantle, you know, the, the system of privilege, and it talks about undermining a so-called westernized we nuclear family. We disrupt the western prescribed nuclear family structure. I eat mom and the dad, that sort of thing. So I'm just saying for reasons like that, those are solid reasons, particularly as, as a Christian, why we ought not to um, find ourselves, you know, collaborating um, you know, deeply with, with the Black Lives Matter organization. Now, I will say this. Some people will take the extra step and say, well, because the organization is so heinous, therefore we ought not to utilize the hashtag Black Lives Matter or kind of take that angle. I would say this, at very least, for those who, who take that position, at least ask yourself the question, why is it that that phrase has has get, has resonated with so many people of color? I'm saying, what is it about this term Black Lives Matter that has, has allowed for it to gain so much traction? Mm -hmm. Now we can argue some of that is by George Soros, Soros you know, pumping money into the organization and advertising. But there's something about that phrase that really, uh, you know, resonates with people. Mm -hmm. And I think that if that's if there's any um, reality to some maybe some conditions that, you know, give rise to people feeling that they need to assert the Black Lives Matter, then maybe we should you know pay attention to those things. Regardless of what the organization is doing, yeah, uh, go, go, but you know, white, black, whatever, I don't support. I, you know, I don't rock with Black go, Lives Matter. Either. Going, going back uh, a little bit to what you said earlier, because this is something that's still a sticking point for a lot of people, and I'm saying that because I posted, I posted a video um, about how the organization is sort of um, taking advantage of uh, of people's feelings about this and using a slogan to to use that for their political uh, claims, which most of them have nothing to do with 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 black lies um but your point that the uh, about the proposition or the claim or the statement black lives matter i've seen people in the comments of that video that i made saying that if you say black lives matter it, you're saying they're interpreting it as only black lives matter which which Oh, obviously, right, right, right. obviously isn't the claim. And so I, I responded to one. I was saying, you know, if, if you look at like the Beatitudes and Jesus saying, blessed are the poor, blessed are that, you know, if you're consistent, then when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, you, right, you right, would have right. jumped in on him and said, no, wrong, Jesus. It's, now you're just saying only the poor are blessed. And you're saying yeah. that other people <laughs> aren't blessed. Whereas what Jesus was saying is, guys, you know, you think that you're not blessed. <laughs> you think that you're you think that your group is not blessed because look, these other people are rich and they have the, you know they have all the money and life is easier for them and life is hard for you. Blessed are the poor. You know you're you're blessed, but it's it's going to be in a, in a in a different in a different way. And so you're blessed too. You're not blessed in the exact same way as everyone else, but you're you're blessed too. So on the meaning of Black Lives Matter, is that? <laughs> Which is funny because I've yeah, well, I mean, never it's... once interpreted it as only Black Lives Matter, but there are people over and over and over again. You're saying only Black Lives Matter. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's yeah obviously I... silly. I mean, it's it's not yeah. nobody saying Black Lives Matter only. It's Black well, the, Lives he, Matter the only too. group that I know is the Hebrew Israelites, the the one Westerners. Fair enough. They did that. Yeah. That's it. But they're not representative because yeah. they they're also not big fans of uh, of it. But I mean, what? the reason is is for hundreds of years in American society, it's just a fact through multiple systems and structures it's been said black lives don't matter or they don't matter as much or they matter less for example um you can uh kill black folks and not be prosecuted uh cops can 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 do it and, and these are just realities children can get it too i mean uh you can be married and we can just rip apart your family structure so you know, I, so I'm glad people are against uh, the the destruction of the nuclear family that, on the BLM website, but they need to make sure. Remember, mm -hmm. the white supremacist structure of of American slavery said, "Oh, I'm gonna sell you down the river. I don't care if that's your husband or wife." It, it was destructive to the nuclear family by the very fact of what it was, right. and so we just we need to make sure. So that's why the 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 phrase became important because of the fact of everything prior, but no one. Uh, except for maybe one Westerners is saying they're the only lives that matter. It's just well, see, this is, this is where it gets really weird is because um, when I think about Black Lives Matter or whatever, you think about like, what are what are they fighting for? Right. And I, it all started with like the, the cops, you know, with the George Floyd. I'm not this time is George Floyd, though, and all these other, you know, it's related to the police brutality. But if we do have uh, statistics and stuff that don't support that narrative, then again, all of these things are based on misinformation, you know. And so that's what I mean. And I'm not saying that there's not. Um, 
you know, like prejudice against blacks or whatever like that. But I think that if we it's again about that truth, that foundation, because the whole nation believes that blacks are killed at a disproportional race right now. Right. I mean, a disproportional rate than white people by police officers. And they think that's what the cause of uh, this is the reason for the movement. But if that's not even a fact, everything built off of there is just like, you know, it gets so sloppy here because everybody's hearing these different things and different people are pushing their narratives through Black Lives Matter. And so we have all of these different views and stuff like that. And so that's why I think truth at its foundation needs to be important. Um, but real quick, because I, I, I'm i actually I, I've got to get off of here. I got to uh, run. Um, but anyways, real quick, I did want to say, though, like when it comes to this separatism and all this other stuff, I really think that like, yeah, the axioms and stuff that we do build these beliefs off of is going to be that um, if we're all one in Christ, we don't identify so strongly with our race. Right. Um, because that would mean our identity is higher than that of Christ. You know, and so that's what I think is the core problem with a lot of this stuff is that we want to find value in these other things. So that way we can feel better about ourselves and feel superior to other people. People, but Christianity really cuts away at that over and over again because we all are Jews that we've been adopted into that family in that sense biblically. So, so I want to say so. Uh, you, thanks, guys. You got to cut out now, man. Got to cut out. All yep. right, you guys keep your rock. Cut out, and then I'll see you what the camera looks right. like. Peace. All right, man. Yeah, next. Yeah. John, man, he's never even been to Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, to, to his point, I think one of the things is unfortunate is that um, I almost think that. And I'm, I'm going to intentionally misuse the term. I'm all, I almost think that the, that the phrase Black Lives Matter is a misnomer. And here's what I mean by that. You know, let, let's say that you have an incident where a black man is pulled over by, by a police officer and, you know, is, is like cussed out for no reason. Mm -hmm. Right. That's probably not going to make the nightly news. You know, a black man cussed out by a police officer. Right. Uh, for being black or something like that. What would make the news is if a black man is shot, mm -hmm. you know, by a police officer. Right. And so I think that when I think about like the you know the issue of police brutality, I I don't think that most people, including Black Lives Matter, are are really saying that 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 one aspect is is the real issue. I think it's just something that represents a larger problem. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so it, it it points to something more broad, i.e. that there's that there's this narrative present. Um, you know, they would say amongst police officers, but not just that. I mean, you, you think about the Trayvon Martin case and, and uh, or the Ma Arbery case. I mean, these those weren't officers, uh, you know, um, at that point. But just there's this narrative where, um, you know, black people are devalued. And it's almost like Martin Luther King said is that, you know, um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like when I think about the Holocaust, for example, you know, Hitler didn't just wake up one morning and say, hey, we're just going to gas all these Jews you know, it, it, you didn't just kind of pull it out of thin air. You know, by the time Hitler brings about his so-called final solution, there had already been decades of, you know, denigrating the Jewish that, that were among them. I'm saying going back to World War One, there had already there had already been these these Darwinist ideas about the, you know, the impurity of the Jews and, and other races and the superiority of the Aryans. And so in a sense, by the time Hitler comes along with the Holocaust and, and that final solution, the, the 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 pump had already been primed amongst the German populace, you know, through negative narratives about you know, dehumanizing narratives about the Jews in order to make that possible. And so, likewise, when it comes to the, the notion of what is the view of African American lives, of Black lives, if that um, if you have erroneous narratives in respect to that, then you do have a, a bigger danger than any one incident. And I think that's that's kind of where, where people are trying to get to. However, I, to be honest, I think most Black Lives Matter folks, they don't um, articulate their position well enough to make that clear. I mean, at least from, from what I've seen. You know, so, yeah. Um, oh, boy. What's up? <laughs> I don't know. I keep on debating if I should read some of these comments. Check this out. We can read some comments real quick. Listen, to the, the dis listen Adam, listen to this, David. Uh -oh. The disparity in deaths by police are largely caused by socioeconomic disparities, and you can't explain them without IQ gaps between ethnic groups. You cannot. Yeah, you, you can't. Ex you can't explain. He's saying you can't explain the economic disparities without explaining IQ gaps between ethnic groups, and that leads to more people getting shot by cops. So, <laughs> short version is. Y'all getting killed by the cops because y'all stupid. So, that's, yeah. that's basically what he's. That's basically what he's, he's trying probably to feeling say. To, to the bell curve. Now, so that, that was a, a paper that came mm -hmm. out actually not all that long ago. But the bell curve was this, this idea that you do have these IQ disparities between races, um, and I can draw some delineations there. Now, here's, here's what's interesting about this though. Here's here's where I think 
it, it, it does get interesting because a lot of times when we're talking about these things, people say things like, well, what about black and black crime? Or what about criminality among black people? Things like that. And, you know, one thing I do argue is that th- there's more going on with, with crime and criminality than race. I'm saying if, if you're going to say, well, <laughs> if you say, what about black on black crime, then you're just telling me who's doing you know, the mm-hmm. crimes. You're not telling me about why. You know, I, I actually I do think that socioeconomics come into play. I do, I do think that no question the literature points to. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, obviously, I, 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 I grew up I grew up I grew up in a I grew up in a as everyone knows, I grew up in a West Virginia trailer park. There was not one. There was not one of us kids in there who was who were not stealing, breaking into stuff. We were all doing it. It was just it's normal. That that's how you grow up. That's what all your friends are on doing. On my paper, on my paper route. Mm-hmm. And I lived in a poor part of town. Uh, a lot of transplanted uh, folks from the Appalachian area who who lived in this area, and then it was surrounded by black neighborhoods. So it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, situation there, right? But I, I on my paper route, I had one trailer park, right? And, uh, you know, you're delivering your papers. The only place where I had a regular deal with neighbors stealing the papers off another neighbor's front porch was in the trailer park. And the trailer park, they're always stealing each other's papers. It was like whoever woke up first. Bro, that is a white crime right there, man. I never saw that. I don't think this happened in the black community. I don't think there's a rash of, of newspapers on the black community. Well, I would go into the, the – the, I'd knock on the trailer park door – Come on in. And I didn't really want to come in because they're small and they smell, right? But I got to come in to get my money. Hey, right? let's stop being racist. Stop being racist. I'm just, well, hey, I'm just stop being racist experience. against the trailer park, bro. man. Okay, I'm just telling just you, these right there, particular bro. ones, okay, it's a fact. And I, so I go in there and like, now I'm not paying because I haven't got my paper three out of four weeks. Well, I, I know I delivered it, sir, right there. And so now they're not paying. So I got to get the manager involved. We do an investigation. Well, I figured out what it was. <laughs> my neighbor, I make more on my income tax. I pay more on my income taxes, and he makes all year. That's why he's stealing my paper. <laughs> I remember I mean, this. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, so poverty has. And now, here's what's interesting. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. This, this, I know some people are gonna disagree with this, and they're not gonna like it. But I'm gonna, I'm, I think that there's, and I'm, I'm just trying to be fair. I'm just trying to keep it 100. I believe that there is still a significant race problem today. However. However, I do think that people on that who are following my side of the conversation and agree with me on that typically do a poor job at accounting for other contributing factors that have to do with why things are the way they are right now. In other words, everything is not racism. Some things that are that are that we see in our communities have to do with economics and poverty, right? I really want people to think about this, right? You know, we typically think about like so so let me ask, let me ask you this question, right? Watch this. Watch this. So, so David and, and Bokeh, wh- why are people poor, right? What, why do you why do you get why does poverty exist? What, what do y'all think? A bunch of reasons. Sure, a bunch of yeah. Them. I mean, right. there is systemic injustice, and the Bible right. speaks about this in the Minor Prophets. So, right. so Micah, for example, goes after the rich because they're specifically ripping off the poor. So that's one reason. But then you have Proverbs speaking about poverty come upon a lazy, sleepy, lazy, sleepy ah, people. Right, the, the, right. the book of Proverbs diagnoses part of the problem is is, is, is the lazy fool template. So they uh-huh. turn around, they sleep in, they ain't getting up, they ain't doing nothing. Next thing you know, they ain't got no food in the winter. So there's a variety. Of, those are just two examples I'm kind of, but I'm showing the good, biblical good. model there. Good. Now, here's the thing. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, what is our theology on poverty? Right, because ultimately poverty, you don't you don't see it in the garden, and you definitely don't see it in, in the eschaton after Jesus right, comes right, back. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. a product of the fall, right? But what happens is we're all dealing with this product of the fall, and somebody on the conservative side of the house says, "No, the reason why you're poor is because you're lazy, you ain't doing nothing, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't work, you don't eat, and so on and so forth." Somebody on the left says, "No, the reason why we're poor is because you know these these crummy bureaucrats and, and corporations are screwing up the tax code and, and getting uh, their unfair mm-hmm. share." And so now they, they're taking these man-centered understandings of poverty, and they're both trying to manage you know poverty from an incomplete picture of what poverty mm-hmm. is. But the Bible gives it tells us exactly what's going on mm-hmm. with poverty. It's a product of the fall. And what you see in, in Israel, for example, you see that the you know the, the Boazes of the world, they had you know to obey abide by the, the gleaning laws. They had to leave a certain amount of the crops aside for those who couldn't eat. You know, those who were poor, you still had to work. And if you was you know owed somebody, you might have to be a, a servant, a slave, essentially, in order to work at all. Mm-hmm. You know, both sides are covered. But what we see in society is, you know, the the issue of poverty is being mishandled. Because people are taking a man-centered approach to it. Now, here's what ends up happening. 
poverty is allowed to flourish within our society and it breeds a number of different problems i.e. fatherlessness in certain communities, i.e. crime in certain communities, and so on and so forth, all because we're mishandling this issue of poverty. So that is not necessarily something that's race or racism specific. That's a whole ball of wax that's contributing to why things are the way they are, aside from race. You know what I'm saying? So I think that, you know, we have to do a better job at taking a step back and seeing everything that's going on and not attributing everything to race. But then when racism, you know, does raise an ugly head, we need, you know, we, we do need to address it. But this kind of, I said all that to say this these conversations are way more complicated than what can be accomplished in a bunch of sound bites between you know Candace Owens and and whoever the representative is on the right I guess a uh, Ben Shapiro or something like mm-hmm. that you know I'm saying like you know these conversations you know need to happen in more robust ways and I think most people are maybe accustomed to ha- to having uh, let, let me let me comment on that since you because you know. I love Ben Shapiro videos and stuff, but when, and, and when he's when he's talking about when he's talking about this, I'm, I'm saying because I'm reading a I'm reading a comment here. So here's James Allman. He says they don't graduate high school and they come from broken homes. If you don't want to live in poverty, don't have kids out of wedlock and graduate high school. So that that that's Thomas Sowell. That, that's a, and Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro says the same thing. He says, look, you, you know, if you make bad decisions and you don't, you know, you you make bad decisions with your money and you you get married when I mean you uh, you you have kids out of wedlock and stuff like that. You're you're, you're and you you got a recipe there for being poor. Um, so I, I listen to that and I go, you know, it's right. This is the United States of America. Seems like if you work hard enough, if you work hard enough. You can get out of poverty, and I'm thinking from personal experience. I got out of I got out of prison, convicted, violent felon. What the heck? You know what the heck am I going to do? Who wants to? I know what it's like to fill out those job applications. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? If so, please explain. I know what that's like, and yet it occurred to me: no, I can I can work myself to death. I can sleepless nights, outpacing everyone else. And I can still I can still do what I want in life. And that has worked out. And so it's it's kind of easy to look at look at that and go, no, this is the United States, man. If you work hard, you can you can uh, you know, you can be you can be successful at the same time, given where I came from. It's very, very easy to say, don't have kids out of wedlock, guys. The, the the people who are having kids out of wed. My mom was 15 years old when she got pregnant with me. These are not these are not people who are making fully fully informed decisions about life and it's not taking that account well you did a dumb thing well great you did something you know you 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 got pregnant when you're 13 14 15 years old and we don't want we don't want the person to to abort that but it's easy to sit there and look you you shouldn't have made that dumb decision guess what we're human beings we're going to make dumb decisions right Mm -hmm. how do you how do you move on well here's the thing Uh, my mom she didn't she didn't graduate high school um there were drugs all over the place she's she starts on this on this path when she's 13, 14, 15 years old, she, she really never gets out of it. She really never gets out of that pattern because notice, now you've got a kid, now you have to be working, you don't finish school. Now you're, for the rest of your life, you don't have a degree. You can go, you, could, you can in theory go back and do something about that, but you're working yourself to death as a single mom in a trailer park trying to take care of your kids and the only job you can get is as a bartender. Um, and so, it's easy to say, it's easy to say, well, just make good decisions. But you, you kind of, a lot of people get locked into a pattern of living. And I'm saying this because I'm not just talking about my mom. Everyone is like that. Everyone is like that where I, where, where I grew up. Everyone was having kids when they're 15, 16 years old. They get, they get locked into it. They go, they get a, they get a job wherever they can find it. They get a job at, you know, Burger King and stuff like that. Uh, if you're lucky, you get a job in the coal mines, but you end up, this is, you know, it, it's easy to say, just go off to college and get this awesome career and stuff like these people are, once they've started when they're 13 or 14 years old, they're never in that position to get, they're never in a position to say, yeah, I'm going to go and I'm going to have this awesome career and I'm going to go off. And some of them are, some of them are, uh, but in, in, it's easier, it's easier to say from outside, from a position of success where you never had to go through that. And you can look back and say, well, you should have, you know, you, you know, you should have made great decisions when you're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Well, great. Yeah, you should have. You should have made you uh, should no. have made great decisions when you're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. But in general, 13, 14, 15, 16 year old year old kids are not going to make great decisions, especially if they grow up in an atmosphere where everyone's making bad decisions. 
And so it's, it's yeah, here's, here's what's interesting about you, what you said, though. Now, now I'm going to preface this by saying I, I can't get into it all now, but I think part of the problem is that we're victims of Western individualism, which is totally unbiblical. And I could maybe explain what I mean by that later. But the, the whole thing is this, is that, put it this way, there's a difference between possibilities and probabilities, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's possible that anybody in America can work hard mm-hmm. and, and be balling out of control. That's possible. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. What's probable? What's most likely going to be the case? Mm -hmm. I'm saying for somebody in a particular context to be successful. Now, here's the thing. If there are things that shape those probabilities that are unjust, if there are external factors that shape those probabilities that that maybe flow from the sinfulness of those who maybe have a particular uh, power, you know, have power in some sense or whatever, if those probabilities are shaped by something unjust, then just people, people who are about righteousness, ought to look into those matters and see how we can reshape those probabilities that make it more probable then, mm-hmm. that somebody can, you know, work their way up and, and do whatever it is they need to do. But I see, I, I think the problem is that we've got a totally unbiblical understanding of what our obligation is to other people within our society. Mm-hmm. I'm saying, like, if you look at the Bible, you know, just real quick, like the, the Good Samaritan, you know what I'm saying? Like, when Jesus talks about, you know, loving others as you love yourself, loving your neighbor, rather, you know, you have the, the teacher that's like, well, yeah, who's my neighbor? Right. And then Jesus tells a story about the Good Samaritan and, you know, the, the man who's, you know, fell among thieves. You know, the Samaritan stops and, you know, make sure that, you know, the dude's all right. And then at the end of the parable, Jesus asks a question. He actually flips. He says, OK, now, who was a, who was a neighbor to mm-hmm. the man who was along the side of the road? Right. So, again, the, the teacher asks Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus is like, no, you got it backwards. Who have you made yourself a neighbor to? Mm-hmm. That's the real question. That's how you live out the biblical ethic. And so the Good Samaritans stopped what they were doing and invested their time, energy, and resources in helping somebody else. Well, as Christians, we're supposed to be the same way. Love, that's what love looks like. We ought to be stopping our own agendas and attending to, get, you know, investing our time, energy, and resources into the well-being of others. Now, if we do that, now we actually venture beyond this sense of, like, Western individualism that I think that we've all, are all, in some sense, uh, beholden to. It really flows out of the Enlightenment period. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We've actually gotten into the biblical ethic and I think we will see, you know, greater outcomes for other people. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not supposed to keep brokenness of the brokenness of this world at arm's length. No, we're supposed to get our hands dirty and do something about it. That's yep. the biblical ethic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, um, I, I want to. There's a couple things that that I want to point out here. So, as I pointed out, you know, a lot of this is kind of easier said than done. And I like your distinction between possibility and probability. Yeah, someone who grows up in a poor place and a messed up family can be a success, it, it, it happens, it, it, it happens. Uh, but, you know, probability wise, most of, you know, most of the, the kids I grew up with did not end up uh, successful. They ended up having kids when they're when they're young and working in order to take care of their their kids. And, you know, you got to respect, it, especially the ones that did the right thing. And they they put their they put their kids first and they worked their, you know, they worked their butts off to take care of the kids. You, you got to respect them for that. But, it, you know, it's easy. It's 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 easy to say, well, if you just made smarter decisions when you're 15, 16 years old, you wouldn't have been in that position that that's true. But, you know, how do you how do you ever move forward once you get into that position? Um, and so that's kind of one thing. Here's the thing, though. Um, when I think about what the message has to be to people in a poor community, the current message is you're being oppressed. Uh, you're being taken advantage of by rich people. Therefore, you need to go after all those rich people and make them and make them hand over their money. It's 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 their fault. And you look and you say, yeah, that guy has billions of dollars. Look at my mom. She works hard, um, and you know she can she can barely she can barely you know she can barely put food on the table. And so there's a tendency to blame those people when when I'm thinking about what the message needs to be to people. It kind of has to be more on the Ben Shapiro side of things in terms of in terms of re- personal responsibility in terms of it can't be you got taken advantage of by the system and now you're screwed unless you can bring down that entire system because guess what now you're you are stuck forever right you are stuck forever and if you ever do bring down that system guess what it didn't help you cuz those are the people who make the who make the jobs as far as people it, it, the message has to be dude if you work hard enough you can be more successful it kind of has yeah. to be that because it there one that you know the the sort of burden of personal responsibility needs to be on you that 
you can't be thinking all your life i'm i'm a victim of everyone else and that's why i'm there so i think that's the that's the the, the good part of ben shapiro's message uh, when i you know when i got out it was just it was not oh i'm such a victim here I, I didn't have any sort of victim mentality because i'd done so much screwed up stuff that no i i put myself in this position this is not this is not people discriminating against me or something like i put myself in in this position because i was there because i'd done horrible things so it was okay if if that's a situation i'm in then i mean this is either the way things are and i'm stuck like this or i just have to work hard enough to to get out of it so i'm thinking that yeah. that has to be a big part of it but as you're as you're as you're as you know going along the lines of what you're saying let me let me just tell you uh, another personal experience here um I got a job eventually teaching uh, for a test prep company. So people who take the SAT and the GRE and, and these tests and stuff, um, I did really well on those standardized tests and got a job for a company that teaches you know high school students and college students how to take um, how to take these these tests. And so I was working for those companies, and I noticed very quickly, class after class, all the students in those classes were white or Asian. All the students in those classes were white or Asian, right? And so I'm sitting there thinking, this seems to be an economic issue, right? That, that you know, because these classes cost can cost thousands of dollars, depending on, you know, what, 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 what package you get. These classes can cost thousands of dollars. If you come from a poor, if you come from a poor area, you're not sending your kid to a class on how to take, a, you know, SAT or something like that that costs you thousands of dollars. You just can't. So, but notice, the kids who take those classes, your score does go up. Your SAT score is going to go up two or 300 points by taking that class, learning how to do, how to break down every question you're going to be faced with, um, memorizing the definitions of the couple hundred most common words that are used on there, learning every sort of math problem that they're going to, your score goes up hundreds of points. Well, guess up, guess what? Because of an economic situation, now you have white kids and Asian kids whose scores are, are skyrocketing. And so you, you look at a situation like that and on the one hand, you want to say, you know, can a poor person achieve the same results? Well, yeah, you don't get to take the class, but you could sit there and study the SAT. You can go to the library and sit there and study an SAT. It's not as easy for you to do because you're not being handed that opportunity and put into a, a you know structured class by your parents and stuff like that. You can do it. So you, you can say that you can still get it done. You can still rock your SAT and study study on your own. But there is clearly a problem there. And so going along with what you're saying that, you know, with a, with a whole community, you know, that if, if, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, trying to, trying to, to mitigate these kinds of disparities and so on, you know, the inclination would be, all right, well, why don't a couple of people who teach test prep do some free classes for people in communities that cannot afford them so that, you know, kids who, whose parents can't afford them, but who are motivated enough and would like to take the class there you go in and and you 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 help them you help them out and so that i think is you know you, you have to emphasize guys you just you just got to work hard you can't be sitting around blaming everyone else and nevertheless there are people who are in an in a less privileged position who don't have the same opportunities as other people and so how do you how do you actually help people who if they had the help would actually make it and be successful but you know it, 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 they still need they still need some help um so anyway that's just, yeah that's good, that's good i mean but and that, that's perfect because th there's essentially there's an intersection between personal accountability and i guess what i refer to as charity you know i'm saying you, you got personal responsibility you know you got to get up and get on your grind mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying but at the same time you also have you know for those who do have the means can be charitable and there's this intersection between the two that'll bring about a greater level of well-being for somebody. But I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, on the one hand, I, I, I'll never forget. So I, I was in like fifth or sixth grade or something like that. And I was just making bad grades. You know, I, was, I was, wasn't doing well, FDs or whatever. You know, I don't even know how you do that, you know, that, that early in school, but you know, somehow I managed to do it. And um, my dad, he was, um, he came to me and said, look, we help, you with your, we help you with your homework every night. There's no reason why you should be getting F's and D's. Now, the reality is, because they were helping me so much in my schoolwork, mm. when I would go to class, I didn't really know the stuff. And then when I would take the test, I would fail. That's, that was the problem. Mm -hmm. So my dad says, look, here's what's going to happen. From now on, we're not helping you at all with your homework. Sink or swim, it's on you. You will get the consequences <laughs> of, 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 that come along with not doing well. And if you do well, you get a reward. But at the end of the day, it's on you, brother. That's, that's it. I kid you not, that next semester, I mean, that, that next grading period, 
I made honor roll for the first time. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying first time ever. You know, because that security blanket was taken away. I had to actually put in some real work. And I felt proud of it. I, I still remember it to this day. You know what I'm saying? This is my first time making a 3.0. So there's this element of self-determination. There's this element of, hey, I got to get on my grind and do what I got to do. You know, now at the end of that, you know, obviously my, my parents are still feeding me. They're, they're still providing an environment within which studying can occur. You know, there's all kinds of things there. You know what I'm saying? So I can't say that I did it all on my own. But you got to give you know put your best foot forward. You know what I'm saying? And I think that there's, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm going to just keep it 100 and, and bring it back to the issue of race. I'm going to just keep it all the way real. I think part of the problem that we have right now in most of these discussions is that there's this hot potato of blame that people want to toss back and forth. Mm-hmm. Black people want to blame, not all black people, but many black people want to blame the man, white people or whatever for everything that's going on in the black community. And they don't want to deal with issues that are internal to, to the community. Mm-hmm. All communities have problems. All cultures have problems. You know and so you have to be real about that. On the flip side, you have people who are outside the black community that don't want to acknowledge anything, any, any of the issues that, mm-hmm. that are going yep. on uh, that have brought about certain outcomes. And so that's why, you know, when a black person says A, B, and C about police brutality, is, oh, what about black and black crime? And then, the, you know, then you, they, you know, so the, the hot potato gets tossed that way. And then, you know, the black person was, well, yeah, but we would have a black and black crime if it wasn't for this, that, and the third. So this, there's this hot potato when really what happens is, there should be this intersection, like you described, between self determination and personal accountability, and the you know and charity. You know what I'm saying? Like and in, in really interacting with other people in a just way. There, there's a there's a, a complementary relationship between the two. Mm-hmm. But in the world, I mean, to be honest, I don't I don't see how that's possible. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not trying to be a, a nihilist about it, but I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure that that in the world that, that folks have the capacity to make the, the kind of change necessary to correct these things. I think the best hope that we have is the gospel and 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 for Christians to live out the scope of the gospel and exemplify what it means to be just and thus you know through that we can shed some light on things but in and, in and of themselves I'm not sure if those in the world have the capacity to, to really make that happen you know what I'm saying yeah uh, we, we definitely need the, the the gospel because you know that really changes what you how you view other people and the significance that other people have and so yeah it's kind of it's kind of a i think we agree on sort of you need a you need a mixed approach on on the one hand because i want to i want to tell you know i want to tell people who either come from a poor poor background or are getting out of prison or something like that i'm like look don't you you don't have time to sit around complaining dude you have to you know whatever if you're black and you're and you're and you're worried uh you know you're saying hey the the reason i'm here is because so and so has oppressed me guess what that that may be that may be true there may be people who you know because of historical situations you ended up in a poorer community and you're in an underprivileged status but guess what look you want to beat whitey you want to beat whitey you gotta outwork. You gotta outwork Whitey. You gotta. You gotta be better than Whitey. You need to raise better kids than Whitey. You need to be the. You need to be to work before Whitey. You need to leave work after Whitey. You need to be better than than Whitey. And that's that's how you beat Whitey, right? Not by not by you know, sit, you know, trying to trying to trying to tear down everyone else. So on the one hand, there has to be that, um, and you don't want you don't want people to just become like completely you know dependent on on the system because that that doesn't help them. And yet. There are people who just kind of need a little boost, right? They do need, they do, they do need help. There are people who, if you, you know, if you, if they, just, it's almost like because I'm saying this because I, I felt like this when I was, you know, I was doing, I was doing graduate school, and had, and had kids, and we, th- there was a time when things were so bad we had to send our oldest two kids to live with, uh, with their grandparents because we couldn't, we couldn't even feed them. That's how messed up it is that you know I'm in school, I'm in school. We had. By this time, we had four kids. Two were disabled, so my wife has to be taking care of the disabled kids. So I have to be providing for the family, but I'm also in in I'm in school. I'm in school, so it was just a it was just a nightmare. We couldn't even feed, we couldn't even feed people. But the whole time, I felt like I just need a I just need a little bit of break or some room, some breathing room to catch up. And if if I can actually get start if I can get started if I get a little you know breathing space. Um, right, right, then right. I would then I would actually be, and I think a lot of people are in that situation. They're so bogged down by life just crashing down all around them that they hear, "Well, why don't you just work harder?" And it's, what are you talking about, man? I'm, I, you know, I'm barely, I'm barely, you know, I'm struggling, I'm struggling it, to survive. Whereas those people, if they could just kind of catch up and get a little bit ahead, bam, they they right. they just they just take take off. And so, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, so so there's there's 
it's not there's no mutual exclusivity between being on your grind and mm-hmm. doing what you got to do and contending against injustice wherever it is. I mean, you can do both. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't have to camp out on, okay, I'm just going to be mad about injustice, you know, 24 seven. Yeah. I'm, I don't like injustice too, but at the end of the day, I got four kids. So I got to get get out here and do what I need to do. And I, you know, legally, obviously, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want anybody to misinterpret that, you know what I mean? But you know, you got to do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that, you know, we, we have to do better about um, taking a more careful, you know, measured approach instead of just, you know, that hot potato of blame back and forth. Like everybody just need to look in the mirror, man. What, what can I do to, you know, get myself in a better position? And, you know, what can I do to help somebody else? You know what I'm saying? Love others as I love myself, right? You know, like what can I do to help the next man? And if we adopt that posture, then I think we'll really chip away at, you know, what we're seeing in society. Or you know, or even if not, shoot, at least we'll be living out the biblical ethic, you mm-hmm. know, and I think that's that's where we want to be. You know. All right, we haven't uh, we haven't heard from vocab in about a thousand years, so uh, <laughs> right. we we did have some other issues pulled up. So let's go ahead and kind of zoom through them rapid fire here in about over about the next ten minutes. Um, <laughs> all right, vocab, you ready? Yeah, in fifteen minutes. Yep. Uh, head over to YouTube.com/slash vocab alone because I am airing about. 15 minutes worth of bloopers from Islamicize me. All right, so uh, you definitely want to see him as well as part of a deleted scene. Yeah, let's so let's all do that. Then. I'm gonna drop the link. Let's all uh, right uh, right after we finish this, we'll finish this right before uh, uh, we'll finish this in 15 minutes, and then we'll all head over to Vocab's channel. All right, Vocab, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, up on the screen here, yeah. we have the <laughs> Land of Lakes uh, original wrapping, and we have a Native American. Native American woman uh, holding some butter, and so that was that was the rapper recently, and now of course, now of course we have the new version, and she's been removed. She's been taken off, which kind of makes sense mm. because now it, it's land of lakes. It's not land of Native Americans. It's uh now it's just a lake. Now they just have a picture of a lake up. So uh, this is part of a pattern, and we can we can go ahead and uh, bring up um, we can go ahead and bring up a couple more issues, but uh, let me get this. So as far as things being canceled, let me see if I can get this article pulled up. I believe I have the technology here. Well, wait, can you go back to the Land of Lakes picture with the? Native lady, one more time. Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, let, let, me, let me read this real quick, and then we'll kind of... Dis- Wait, matter of fact, just, just let me read these uh, couple headlines real quick, and then we'll kind of discuss all of them sort of one at a time. Okay, so uh, here we have from CNN, Confederate statues are coming down following George Floyd's death. Here's what we know. And so we got this issue of statues of Robert E. Lee and other Civil War figures. Um, there's statues being pulled down. I don't think we've ever... Uh, we've ever talked about that. And so, uh, and then the other one we'll discuss here in a minute. Matter of fact, let me just go ahead and let me just go ahead and pull it up real quick. Um, <laughs> another one, since we've got Adam Coleman here, since we've got Adam Coleman Uh-oh. and he's got some issues. <laughs> Uh-oh. Here we have we, uh, we here? Redskins to drop name, yielding to pressure, <laughs> yielding to pressure from sponsors and activists, Redskins are dropping their name, yielding to pressure from sponsors right. and activists. And, and for real, they're talking about dropping the Redskins. That's not good enough. That, I mean, at least it's not going to be good enough for long because they're going to have to drop the Washington too because that dude was a total slave owner. So you got to yeah, drop yeah, You got to drop both of them. You got to drop You got to drop the whole The whole thing. All right, vocab on the Land of Lakes. You say you want me to put it back up? Well, yeah. Which one, the old or the new? The old one. Okay. We got the old one. All right, we got Land of Lakes up. All right, this is gonna end up being really bad. Whatever's happened about to happen. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I got a bad feeling about that. Yeah, I always get nervous. Vocab, I feel like he's gonna get my can- my channel canceled or something like that <laughs> by doing something dumb. Like you, you just came back like not too long ago. Yeah, I know. So to... What's wrong with him? Me? 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 You saying vocab? Vocab, is like why did you want this? Rich? Why did you want this up? I got Land of Lakes <laughs> up on the screen, and you're just quiet. Well, one thing about. That I say it's negative about them changing the logo is that if you notice, if you cut a slit right there and right there on each side of the lady, and then you can do a little trick where you fold up where her knees are, 
and you can fold it up right where her chest is, and it creates a virtual illusion. Oh, and now I get that's it. gonna be lost. I get it, you pervert. What the heck? That's what. See, this is what I mean. This is what vocab adds to the lines. Vocab, vocab is Professor Griff. That's, yeah. that's what he is. Guys, d- guys. <laughs> he comes on your channel. It's a wrap. Yeah, guys, do you understand what vo- vocab is talking about here? He's pointing out what li- you know, little uh, you know, eight-year-old kids do, and they think it's fun. They get the Land of Lakes wrapper, and then you see the knees there. Well, if you fold the with the knees up to where she's holding the butter, it, you know, you get this optical illusion there. And uh, well, super mature vocab, super mature. So this is this I thought, is. I thought that was an important point. We are losing that aspect of culture. Vocabs. This is th- this is the level of vocabs thinking on issues of race, and cancel culture <laughs> in general. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. All right. Let's go through a couple of these uh, thoughts. Thoughts on the Redskins. Now we ac- so, we actually right, so we actually have a, a a shame riddled <laughs> Redskins fan here. <laughs> so I, it's I, not right. me. It ain't me either, <laughs> son. <laughs> all right, so like real talk. So I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. Mm-hmm. Ten minutes outside DC. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in the '80s, and I mean, my whole family was Washington football fans. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna use the name. I'll just say they're Washington fans. I grew up. It's, it's, it's been in my family for, you know, I get well, like really, like you know, however long, like 100 years or so. I don't know how. I mean, whatever. It goes way back. Anyway, my point is. Uh, growing up, I was a Washington fan. I mean, I actually met Doug Williams. So if people don't know who Doug Williams is, Doug Williams was the first black quarterback to, to win a Super Bowl. He came to my church. I met the guy. We had, you know, had got his autograph. I had, you know, met Bobby Mitchell. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about that. It goes way back. Now, that's when I was a kid. Now, when I was a teenager, you know what I'm saying, I realized that, you know, the name's probably not that cool. It's, it's probably kind of, you know what I'm saying? I mean, like, as I was going into college, I was like, eh. I'm not really rocking with it, you know, and so for a good decade and a half, I just I, I just boycotted. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm no longer be a Redskins fan. I was a Titans fan for a while, then I was rocking with the Chargers, and my most recently, the, you know, the Baltimore Ravens. And then I actually thought about going back to being a, a Washington fan because I was like, okay, well, suppose it was named after some, um, you know, some chief or something like that. It was like a warrior or something. It was supposed to be like kind of, you know, respect to him. So for like a, a half a season, I was I was a Washington fan again, and I was like, nah, but you know, I I got the True ID podcast now, so I can't be you know True ID, the real you and Mago Day, and then like you know rocking with the most like racist name <laughs> in, in all mm-hmm. the sports, you know. So I had to drop it again, you know. I had to kind of let it ride. However, I'm saying I was elated, like you know, about a week or so ago, they announced that the Redskins name, the Washington uh, name is, is they're taking Redskins out of it. And I think they're going to replace the logo as well. Mm-hmm. And so when I read the article, like I mean, I was like, oh, so, I mean, I was hype. I, I, was, I was up here working on my stuff uh, for the job. I, I was yelling down the steps to my wife, like, like, babe, I'm back. I'm back in Washington finally. You know, after boycotting the, uh, the the squad for all these years, so I'm like, nobody's more excited about this name being changed than I am. So you I, are I don't a know fan. Where you're gonna change it to. You're a I am fan. A true, I am a fan. I am a fan. Now, there's been a couple proposed names that I'm not really like too keen on. Like, I think they were talking about like maybe the Red Tails. I think that's a horrible name. I mean, I, I get it. I mean, I, I, you know, much respect to the actual Red Tails historically, but I think that's a terrible name for for a sports franchise. So I hope they don't go there. I heard Warriors. I don't know if they're going to do that or not, but you know, um, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm I'm just happy to be home. I'm just happy to be back in Washington. That's that's all I'm saying. I guarantee you. I've been saying it for years. If we change the name, we're going 16 and 0. I'm telling you. I've yeah, been saying like, that. For what, years. What, what were you guys last year? Like three and 13 or something? Oh, I'm, I, we're getting this, it's a Super Bowl now. Like we're, going, we're going from three and thirteen. Like it's automatic Super Bowl, guaranteed. Yeah, my view on that is, uh, yeah, I, you know, is I m- m- mentioned earlier that originally, you know, red skin was just it, it was you know people weren't using technical terms for racist and they referred to black, white, and and red. And so, you know, back when people were referring to red skin, you know, they meant it as a in a in a kind of warrior sense. But things can take on new connotations and. You know, changing the name of something is, you know, for for the for the diehard fans who are like, but I got like three jerseys and then now they're they're not even going to be correct and stuff. Uh, you know, gosh, there I feel like there are worse things in the world that you could experience than your team changing a name because some people, even a minority of people are upset about it and don't like it. And they view that as, you know, as a um, as a a pejorative term 
for them. And so, guys, yeah, you know, you just you just got to make you got to make some changes a, a, along the way. And uh, if it doesn't bother anyone, then hey, if it bothers enough people, then why wouldn't why wouldn't you want to you know why wouldn't you want something that uh, that everyone can get on board with? At the same time, at the same time, you do have to wonder where does it stop? Like, does it ha you know do you need to change the Washington part because people are going to be upset and offended at that, and they want to you know tear down everything to do with. Uh, with Washington and, you know, at, at what point do you, like almost everything, almost everything you could tear down and say, you know, because of this a hundred years ago or 150 years ago, you now have to have to tear that down. And so this goes back to the, uh, uh, what do you guys think about Confederate statues being torn down? What do you guys think in the, in the, in the chat about the Confederate statues? Now I understand that you, I understand you got, you know, there are issues with like statues of Lincoln being knocked down and stuff like that. But as far as like Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson or something like that, where do you guys stand in the chat? What What are your guys' thoughts? Okay. What, 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 well, what I want to first say, oh. uh, you know, Adam, if you want to leave the Washington Redskins when they're the Redskins and go to other teams, that's understandable <laughs> well, and all that. Uh, but, but all the flip-flopping in between there, I don't know what's wrong. What, yeah. I, what, what was the what, uh, fair weather? You know, what, what was it with that? Here you go. I just, like, you know what, man? I, how many I, I teams did, was that in the meantime, bro? Yeah, like, the Titans uh, for about three like, months. It was the Jaguars. Uh, the, the Chargers was probably the main one. And then, and then the, the Ravens moved to Baltimore, so they kind of gave me a home base. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so whatever. I rock with them from there. So I, I, you I know, know I heard the story already. I'm surprised you're willing to admit, <laughs> like, admit it. It's a this is uh, like. No, I want to say this real quick. I mean, like, th there is a, a local precedent about changing names. Like, so so back in, I guess, maybe like the late 90s. Is there a local precedent know? of changing teams every other month, too? <laughs> there you go. Look, my, I'm, so I'm used to it. Cause like my, my friend's been joking on me this for, for that for years. But um, the Washington Wizards used to be the Washington Bullets. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? That was, that was their name prior to. But they changed the name Bullets because of all the crime, you know, violent crime going on in Washington, D.C. So it's kind of like a show of good faith. You know the the basketball team changed its name from the Bullets to the Washington Wizards. You know what I'm saying so like there's kind of like a local precedent for you know changing names, you know so to speak for for good reasons I think. You know what I mean? Um, uh, for, so someone blocked Freer Rudolph's comment, but he said Washington Rednecks would be a great name to make it more inclusive for David. <laughs> I got blocked for that. Oh, I come from a, I, I, I have a hillbilly background. Uh, BFG ten thousand said Washington bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> that would that, yeah, would, that yeah, would actually yeah. uh, that would actually no, good. No, here, you know what, some of these I, I recognize we got almost a thousand people in here but uh some of these comments um some people are uh, in all seriousness are saying adam was the sjw for example because he wanted to leave uh the patently offensive name of the redskins and not root for them and i see all these kind of comments oh, really? um okay. li listen to the live chat listen, yeah listen sjw up. radical like, leftist and Adam and I, Coleman. And I, hey, when you're when there's almost a thousand people in here, you know we've got Kemets, we've got everything, yeah. right? So right, it's yeah, all yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let me let me in a sense of I expect a diversity of ideas. But to those kind of folks, is there any awareness to you who are saying this stuff and asking questions you think are funny? Like, are we allowed to eat brownies still? Do you guys do you do you have any idea the the real history of the United States in relationship to indigenous peoples here? You don't have to be some – it doesn't even make sense why you would think you would need to be a leftist to have some compassion and to have some recognition of the shameful history of the United States government and the peoples and how they have treated Native Americans and why Redskins then, when you have sort of a racial slur as a name, compounds it and is a reminder of that negative legacy. Uh, for example – my folks just visited a small little town in Ohio where the Moravians had established a missionary uh, outpost specifically for the Delaware Indians in that area. And the Delaware Indians, by and large, accepted and embraced Christianity. And they were peaceful, and the Moravians were very peaceful. They just basically believed in praying and and and, and did not bother people, and, and the Delaware Indians followed suit. The Moravians and the Delaware – living together in peaceful harmony, and they were this little enclave. Well, some other Native Americans in that area of the Ohio frontier uh, slaughtered some villagers, uh, some a different Native American tribe. In response, certain Ohioans raised a militia and slaughtered the Delaware Indians, the peaceful Delaware Indians who had adopted Christianity, who were in, 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 in harmony with white Moravians. 
and just slaughtered them and killed them because they couldn't distinguish, well, who were the good ones and the bad ones, and they killed women, and they killed and they just killed them. And, and the thing is, this kind of story could be replicated again and again and again. So to me, I don't understand the, like, total flippancy. Like, mm -hmm. I, I even get people want to disagree. I get all that. But it seems like there's this total lack of awareness and total flippancy. And I don't know you guys' political, spiritual, theological, but if you're a Christian, you've got to do better than this total flippancy in regards to that. It's not saying the United States is the worst country. It's not It's not about that. It's recognizing the reality of where we are now in 2020 based upon this and just kind of really taking this into consideration. Like when my parents relayed that story, because they just visited last week, my heart hurt even though it happened you know a couple hundred years ago it, it just it was it's a heartbreaking story and when you multiply that you gotta see and, you, and then you're dealing with oh the redskins so oh, you know yeah. i don't appreciate adam's flip-flopping after that but leaving the redskins <laughs> was a good idea and i'm glad i'm glad you can feel like you can come but, back but now. no so now, now here's now this is where we can get you know you know, get back to the scripture with it, right? I mean, let me kind of get some context now. And it's not so, a red herring. People are trying to say it's a red herring. How no, is that fine. a red it's herring? I'm, I'm getting it's a little fine. frustrated here, but well, go ahead. Let's, let's connect it back to, you know, something I said in the beginning. Like, at the end of the day, I'm all about being consistent. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's just been baked into me, I guess. Maybe I get it from my parents. But here's the thing. I have grown up my entire life within a societal context within where I'm constantly being told that based upon my skin color, I'm less than. Like that's I'm talking about today in my lifetime. The first time I was called the N word was I was in third grade. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I had to go back Adam, to my mom. Adam, no, no you know? one does that in the United States of America. It doesn't happen. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that you doesn't know? exist. No one says that. Nobody well, says that. What well, were you in third I, grade in the 1820s? <laughs> me, Sorry, man. me, right. I, in the chat in my neighborhood have never seen that. Therefore, it doesn't happen in the United States. Therefore, it doesn't happen. Right. Maybe no, that was so, a dream, Adam. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I imagine like being a parent and having your child. This is what happened. I, I, I was in third grade. I go back. I have to ask my mom, like, what does that word mean? Imagine my being my mom and having to explain to me what the N word means to, to your three to your third grade, right? And so, and I could t recount other, you know, other stories. But my point is this: I can't. I've come up in that kind of scenario. So for me, being a Christian, if I don't like that kind of a thing, if I'm going to live out this notion of loving my neighbor as myself, then I've got to be sensitive in that sense to others who may be offended for reasons that are you know, of a racial nature or whatever. So that's why, yeah, I had to come up off that name. As a matter of fact, shout out to my man Phil Fox. He's a Native American. He was educating me the other day, you know, in terms of we were talking about the whole, you know, Redskins thing, and what he said was that. It's not just the the name in terms of the Redskins thing, but it's like, it, uh, 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 and I'm just have to defer to him. But apparently, among many people in the Native American context, they don't want to be looked at as just being mascots. It's like, look, we're people. You know, like you can't just not deal with us any other time in society, but other than representing us as mascots, like that's offensive. Now, I don't, I, that's not my experience. I don't know what that's like, but I'm still gonna give an ear to them. But like, dag, you know, I never really thought about that. You know, how can I, how do I respond to that morally speaking? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's my whole point is we have to live out the biblical ethic. You know, at the end of the day, um, it, it's just like it's like what Paul says. We talk about those who eat meat and those who don't. Mm -hmm. Like, don't let your liberty be a vice. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm saying brothers, like you know, like you know, de defer to your brothers. And and, and um, if somebody is weak in a particular area, however you want to construe that, mm -hmm. then it, to to walk out love toward that person, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I'm saying I think we have to be careful of that. Yeah, and uh, guys, I gotta I gotta go. Uh, my uh, video's premiering right you're now. You're getting off for a so. video premiere when you could just Come type on, comments man. right there. You could just type comments on this discussion of race, and you're like, oh, my video's premiering, even though it'll just be a regular video 15 minutes from now. Let me let me <laughs> cut out. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, Malone's uh, priorities. You saw, but we got your view on the on Land Lakes. We got your view on Land Lakes, so you can take off. Me and Adam will uh, will 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 carry on. Keep the keep the struggle going. Um, yeah, yeah, right. but no, uh, no problem. We're about to cut out anyway, man. I thought we were about, we were done in like five minutes. Yeah, 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 but we got yeah we got to we got to we got to wrap up. This yeah, discussion you, you keep on dropping nuggets. We gotta we gotta we gotta. Uh, we, I didn't know there was gonna be such a hostile reaction here. Um, oh, okay. okay. Right. <laughs> on the on the issue of on the issue of of redskins. So, guys, we can we can imagine a situation where a term that is not considered you know derogatory could uh, later on be derogatory, and do you then change a, a team name? So. Um, let's just imagine a situation where, you know, Adam, the, the, the calling someone colored now would be considered derogatory, right? <laughs> right, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. Whereas 50 years, 50 years ago, that was, that was like the term of, of, of choice, right? 
That's right. Yeah. That's so right. so yeah. so suppose we 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 modify the situation. Suppose that you know the the term colored. 50 years ago had a positive connotation of like a, a warrior, right? A warrior. Uh, mm. And suppose you named your team after that because you wanted that warrior status. Well, if now the, you know, the, the connotation has changed and now it's interpreted differently, why, why, why would people, I can't understand why people would be so opposing. Well, you, you must be a radical SJW to want to change that. No, you could just be <laughs> saying, well, this is, this is, you know, this is offensive to some people and, we don't want our we don't want the name of we want a team name that everyone can rally around and be happy with and even if some people loved that team name because that's been their team right. name that they've rallied around and that they have you know they grew up with posters on their wall with that team name and they've got jerseys of that team name again right. it's not the i mean the the thing that make us flip out <laughs> the things that you know first world problems the things that make us flip out of all the right, things, right. That, of all the things that can upset you in the world, oh my goodness, he wants to change his team name because some people say, "Here's my only concern with with things like you know changing teams' names and stuff like that." Uh, is yeah. the is the objection really coming from people who are offended by it, or is it just people who are using that issue to try and tear down something else? Right? Because I think that mm. I think a mm. lot of times it is that latter situation where, and, and it, with something like the Redskins, it's a mixture. You got people who are obsessed with tearing everything down. We want to we want to right. level everything we can level right now, and the the easiest way we can get to level something and destroy something and bring something down is if we can call it racist. And there are certain things that you can point to and say, "Look, that's racist," right? And so th these these groups, I never want to kind of kneel to those groups. And so if the charge is coming, if the charge is coming from people who are just, I'm looking for something, I'm looking for something to tear down. I don't care what it is. I'm going to call something racist because I want to tear it down. I don't ever want to, I don't ever want to bend the knee to those, to those people. Yeah, yeah. But if there yeah. are people who are legitimately, who just legitimately say, I don't like the name of my team. Um, yeah. You should consider those people. And you're someone who, you're someone who, you're not just jumping on a, yeah. on a bandwagon. You're saying you were, you know, you had that issue. Yeah, I mean, this, that issue this thing, I mean, it's been an issue for a while, right? Mm -hmm. You know, now there are some things that, that we're seeing going on now where it's obviously kind of like the new wave, you know, of just anti-racism, whatever you want to call it. But with respect to the Washington name, that that's been around for like a while. Now I will say this: it is important to look at just I think the diversity of dynamics that go into it. You have some people who've been saying it for a while, but then you also have the, you know again kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier, you know, the capitalism. You know, I think it was Amazon.com pr prior to Washington deciding to do what they're going to do. Amazon.com Amazon said, all right, we're just not selling any of your merch. You know? mm -hmm. And I think there was a couple other companies as well. It was like, all right, we're no longer selling Washington Redskins stuff. Now, we can't be naive and think that you know, a Dan Snyder, who's the owner of the Redskins, we can't think that he's not looking at the economic impacts of holding onto this name. You know, when, it, when it wasn't going to have him in the pocket, you know, he can kind of stand his ground a little bit, right? You know, but if there's really going to be some economic cost that's going to impact the franchise, just as on a corporate level, you know I'm saying, you know, being, you know, think about a corporate on a corporate level, he has an obligation to his investors, his obligation to his board. And so he's he has to make a decision that's going to make sure that the money keeps flowing, i.e., you know, make some changes with the name and the logo. I mean, all those different things, you know, come into play. And I think that's that's legit. You know what I'm saying? If I was him, that's what I would do. Right. You know, so th there's a whole lot of different di dynamics. I mean, I think that's one thing that makes it different, makes the, the the Washington name thing different from, say, like the Confederate statues. I mean, that's not necessarily a, a business or you know decision type of a deal. I, I don't think, but yeah, I mean, th there's so many different you know aspects that go into these these uh, these discussions. I, I think sometimes people just oversimplify, mm -hmm. you know, in, in ways that that aren't helpful, you know. Um, and, and like I said, I mean, you mentioned the Confederates. I mean, that, that's a whole other ball of wax. I mean, people have different views. I mean, I know you, you posted this in the chat, mm -hmm. so I don't know if anybody responded. But, I mean, that's a whole different ball of wax right there. I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up every day. I went to school. I had to travel along Jefferson Davis Highway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Jefferson Davis was the, he was the president of the Confederacy, right? Yep. Every day. Mm -hmm. You know, so the equipment, imagine sending your child to, to Nat Turner Elementary. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to happen. Like, that would never happen in a billion years, right? You know, Rob, you know, uh, I tell people this all the time. That it, it Actually, as of 2020, this has now changed officially. No, actually, I take that back. I think it was a couple years ago. But when I was in school, right, when I was in school, we didn't celebrate, high school particularly, we didn't celebrate um, Martin Luther King Day. We had Lee Jackson King Day. 
<laughs> Robert mm-hmm. E. Lee, yeah. Stonewall Jackson, and, and Martin Luther King were celebrating. Yeah, you had to tack them on there. Day. I remember. Yeah, you had yeah, to tack that on. Right. That, that's what that's what we had. Now they changed it after, after I, got, I graduated. They changed it some years later, and as of this year, it's officially off the books entirely. But you know, we did the whole thing. Me and Vocab did about uh, you. Know, they, you still have like Confederate Day that's celebrated, like in Georgia, Florida, and these different things. So, I, and I understand like symbols mean different things to different people. But you, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, you. Why would you want to go to a school or travel along a road that's named after somebody that that wanted to keep your your ancestors in in chains? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, like why would nobody? Who would want to do that? It makes no sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I, I agree. That, let, let's let, let's check out. Let's check out some uh, some comments here because a lot of people are uh, flipping out and they're, aff- yeah, if they're wasn't offended. SJW before, they're offended. Sorry, they're yeah. offended at everything <laughs> we say. They're how dare you say that? But we'll defend <laughs> this Confederate statue. But how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> How dare you be offended by a statue of a general for the Confederate states who tried to split, you know, America into two countries? How dare you be offended at that? But I'm going to be super offended that you're offended at that. Yeah, so and I'm offended. Yeah. Right, right. All right, let's check out a couple of comments. So uh, Raymond the Large said, uh, "I'm Native American, and I'm very touched by your kind words and your defense of our people. God bless you." That was a comment to Vocab Malone. Um, so vocab's point was, guys, you know, it, it's really easy for you to sit back and uh, and say, well, gosh, what are these people complaining about? What are these people? What are these people complaining about, guys? There are some people who've had some different experience. I mean, you guys are there are people in the chat who are flipping out because they disagree with us on something. Imagine if something worse happened to you. Imagine if your community was wiped out by people and then they took your name. Can you? The point is. I don't care what the red. I, I'm not in Adam's position. I don't care what the Redskins call themselves. I just don't care. I don't care if they keep the name Redskins. I don't care if they change the name Redskins. I just don't care. I don't like that team. They suck either way, right? <laughs> I do not care if they want to change the name, change their t- you know their team's name. That that's that's that that that's that's up to them. Um, uh, but I un- I ca- I can at least get my mind around someone who would be uh, offended by that. Now, I can get my mind around that, and someone saying, "Yeah, I, I don't want that name. I don't like that name, and I don't. I choose not to support that team." I can understand that, and that's uh, that's what I think. You know, that- I got I got to say this real quick. You, you know, you're my homeboy, I, and you know, I don't mean anything by it. Uh-huh. So I just want to point out that you know, based upon what you just said, there are people in the chat who literally has less have less empathy for other people than a, than psychopath. a psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, point out, just really think about that. Right? I'm a I'm a psychopath, and this this is this is something that I find amazing, and this is a problem across society right now. Namely, that, oh, well, however I feel on this issue is how everyone else should feel on this issue, and if anyone else feels differently because they've had different experiences, well, shame on them. They need to be destroyed. <laughs> right, like, in other words, what 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 the what the what the people here would would find so ridiculous about cancel culture is they're you know they're not canceling people they're not canceling people, but they still have the same issue in that if you disagree with me watch watch a- after after we get off here David I'm gonna get all these messages David I unsubscribe for your channel after you after you said that it's okay for the Washington Redskins to change their name <laughs> you're doing the exact you're doing you're not doing it to the same extent but it's the same thing I cannot I cannot conceive of anyone disagreeing with me on something I'm kind of I'm kind of yeah if you go too far you end up just destroying everything but in this, you have to look on it, at it on, on a case-by-case basis. Is there any sort of concern here that is legitimate? If so, then it's up for discussion. Right. If so, it's up for it's right. up for discussion. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a really messing people up. Watch this. And we're talking about the Confederacy, right? I'm a really mess people up. Now, here's the thing. I, I come from, I'm from Virginia. I'm from the South, right? I, and I went to high school in a very rural area. That's why you got that. Right? That's why you got that Southern accent. Yeah, they, 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 <laughs> they, they, oh, look at that. You know, but so here's the thing. I, I I get it. You know, when it comes to people who say that they want to preserve the heritage of the South, listen, I understand completely mm-hmm. that this, there's more to the South than slavery. That's what, I know it's going to mess people up. Listen, mm-hmm. I understand. I understand that, yep. right? There's there's food, music, uh, you know, cultural habits, and there's all you know. It, it was a complete culture, and I understand that the slavery issue in the Civil War has eclipsed much of that in the public eye. I get that. So if you have a person who says that I love Southern living. I know from mm-hmm. personal experience, from dealing with people from those backgrounds, I know that that doesn't mean that they're necessarily pro-slavery, mm-hmm. right? Therefore, when it comes to, you know, some, if somebody on their private property says, I just love the South and I want to have things you know, representing that in the South, on your own private property, 
God bless you. Do whatever you want to do. That's you. Yeah. That's your right. Mm-hmm. Right now, when it comes to public property, when it comes to parks, when it comes to you know street names and so on and so forth, when you're dealing with public property, now you've got to subject those things to a different lens, through a, mm-hmm. a different lens. Right. You've got to say, does this does Robert E. Lee, is he emblematic of something that the public that, that's representative of the public today? Mm-hmm. And if that's not the case and people go through the proper channels to have him taken down, then as a democratic society, I don't see why anybody would have a problem with that. Now, I'm not for just running up on stuff, tearing it down. That's not my thing. I'm saying I don't, you know, but if people in a particular locality, I'm thinking about Charlottesville specifically, in that particular locality, they voted to have Robert E. Lee removed. Mm-hmm. That's a democratic process. Mm-hmm. Like, nobody should be ticked off about that. It's yep. not infringing on your on your rights. And it, it, people are saying, hey, this doesn't represent us, and we're not going to have it anymore. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm like I'm like Adam in that you know I can I can get where someone's coming from even with I dis, even if I disagree because on the issue of Confederate st- statues I'm like you rebel scum, you fought you lost live with it, ain't no stat should be any statues celebrating your guys I I can I can sit and they're like but you, you know Lee was a great general he's one of the greatest generals in history so you know gr- that's true you had, sure. yeah yeah so y- y- that doesn't mean you celebrate him by honoring him in parks and and on streets and so so anyway well, i mean he, exactly. he, yeah, exactly. they, he didn't do that well at gettysburg anyway i'm just saying he got lethal he made, he made, he made he, yeah that, that was uh that was he made a he made a huge blunder but he actually ran <laughs> out into the middle of his soldiers and acknowledged that he made a blunder one of the few mistakes that dude ever uh, ever made you know so you can res- you can have all the respect for his yeah, military respect, sure. for his military ability and w- i can sit here and say you know, if that if that statue's been in that park for 90 years and, you know, people go to the park and, you know, kids take field trips to the park and they discuss Lee and stuff like that. And so I don't want that thing being torn down and stuff like that. I get that. I, I totally get that. I, I, I get that. You know, that's that's part of the story of the I, that's part of the story of the self. But I also get it when you rebel scum. <laughs> And so I'm not. Well, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, avoc- I mean, I'm not. I want. I just want to be clear. I'm not advocating the mobs going out and and tearing and tearing right, stuff right, right, down. Right, right, I think right. it should be a, a you know a community decision stuff like that. The point is, that people are freaking Absolutely. out. Any sort of change, and some of it's like, wait a minute, these guys, these guys literally tried to destroy the United States of America by 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 splitting it up, in in because you know in defense of slavery, and you're sitting here building monuments to them. Can you at least get your mind around why some people would well, yeah, I mean, would have a problem with that? Would have an issue with it. And, and that's the thing is that there's a difference between preserving history and memorializing it, particular aspects of history. I mean, those are two very different things. I'm saying like so, and, and, and to kind of bring it home, this is really think about it. And, and, and vocab, you know where I'm going this, with this because we had a whole show on it. But you know, if if the the Confederacy seceded from the Union. You know whether you think they were justified or not. Let's just say that if if their secession was to be recognized, then that means that they were an enemy combatant. They were a different nation fighting against you know what we refer to as America today, right? Or let's say that their secession wasn't legit. So then there these are people that are treasonous fighting against the union. So the question is for us today in public spaces, why should we memorialize and honor either traitors or enemy combatants of another nation? That, that doesn't make any sense because if we're going to do that. Then uh, uh, Rommel, General Rommel in World War II, he was a great general. Mm-hmm. The Desert Fox, man, let's get a, let's get a uh, you know something for him. You know, I mean, I, I could be real offensive if I wanted to, but we could talk about you know uh, Osama bin Laden. I mean, he he was doing his thing for a while. Let's, let's build a memorial on him. Obviously, that's silly, mm-hmm. right? Now, here's the thing. Now, I'm gonna end it out with this, but you know, when you think about all this this angst that was over Colin Kaepernick taking a knee towards the flag, and the people say, oh, he's protesting flags, disrespect, and so on and so forth. Well, look, Confederate soldiers. We're shooting bullets at the flag in their time, which represents the union that we're a part of today. Mm-hmm. So you would want to memorialize people who were literally shooting bullets at the flag and be mad about Colin Kaepernick who was taking a knee. That's obviously inconsistent. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with Kaepernick. I'm just saying that let's be consistent. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and at least try to understand where the people are coming from. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it's it, strange when people say, uh, <laughs> they'll say something like, if you say support the, the proper removal of Confederate public plays, you know, funded by tax, you know, that's memorializing. They'll say, "Well, you know, I'm I'm patriotic. If you don't like America, you know, leave it." <laughs> it's like, what? how is it patriotic to support the enemies of the United States? I know I don't understand right. how that's patriotic to to do that. And right. uh, you know, that flag, as we discussed, that's the battle flag of Northern Virginia. 
It's not even actually the Confederate flag for the Confederacy. It's the it's a battle flag that was taken into battle against right. the Union. So it's like it's sort of extra sauce, you know. It's not even their right, actual right, right, right. flag. Not that that would necessarily make, it, but it's like, uh, so how are we gonna, you know, rock that? Like, like it's a good thing. But David over here sounding like the Empire, rebel scum. Rebel scum. That's what the, the Empire. Is, that's what they say to the Probably rebels. Empire, they, man. Yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, well, I see what's really going on here now. Right, right, yeah. right. Apologetics Empire talking about rebel scum. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, and yeah, you you got you got comments. You know, by people who, uh, again, is uh, it's just an ongoing issue of not seeing things from other people's perspective. So just to be clear, because people are pointing out, well, you know, these people are these people tore tore down a Frederick Douglass statue. Uh, these people are are destroying well, or, 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 or destroying yeah, churches. Who, yeah, the, who the, tore down that you. Frederick? Uh, we don't Thank know. You. Thank you. It's it's bait. It's bait to make you say the, the same people. Yeah. We don't know who tore down that statue. That. Well, exactly. re, 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 regard, regardless, nothing, nothing, nothing I've said so far is in support of of the mob. I specific, I specifically said if yeah. if, a, if a community gets to the point where they say, you know what, we don't want that there. That what, what do you say? No, no, because that's right. that's been there for ninety years. It has to be there. It has to be there forever. That I, I just don't get. It's, it's like you know, it's and, like. And, and I would argue that you had the same angst either way because in Charlottesville a couple of years ago, where, where they had that uh, the marches, so that's what the, that's what the situation was. It wasn't people tearing down Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. There was a vote. You know what I'm saying? And, and they voted down. Done by City Hall, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And it, yeah, was it was still taken down. You know what I'm saying? Like these are, these are legal processes. Now you can oppose it. That's fine. You know what I mean? But go through legal processes. I mean, I'm I'm not advocating the mob either, and because I just don't trust people. You know, to go about you know mobbing and doing yeah because because and, because open. once once the mob is empowered to go around enforcing justice, then the mob can kind of go around doing what they want. And so right you, right you, right yeah, that's so, not good. For yeah, and so that yeah, that's that's just bad. Uh, all right, let's take a couple more comments and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it. I think we are going to have to come back to the Colin Kaepernick issue. Uh, oh, yeah, prob sure. Probably yeah. when football season starts, if it indeed right, actually right, right. starts, and we'll see how we'll see how it goes. But, I wrote uh, a whole article on it, so maybe we can cover that. I, I wrote an article. Yeah, on it, because uh, I've had I haven't said much about Colin Kaepernick because I'm I'm trying to figure out how to how to say this um, concisely. Um, when someone is protesting, um, my I, I'm thinking you can you can you can blast something. You can blast something even that you love and that you want to see it change, right? Um, you, yeah. you can you can hey here's this thing that I love and I want to I want to blast away at it because I I, I want the, I really want this thing to change. If so, um, you can protest you can protest all day long. I think protests are great. Even if I happen to disagree with you know how you're doing it and stuff like that, I'm not going to criticize you in the same way that I would if you hate something and you're trying to destroy it, right? You're, sure, you're trying sure, you're sure, trying sure. to to destroy. It. So in other words, what I'm talking about here, when you when you are criticizing the United States, is it because you love the United States and you want the United States to get better? Or is it because you hate the United States and you want to burn it to the ground? That's yeah, that, like you're you're out there protesting. Um, I may disagree with how you're protesting and think, oh, there's a, there's this much better approach you could be taking. And that is not the right approach. But it's it's my concern is, is your heart in the right place or is it not in the right place? That's my main that's my main concern. That's my main concern. Right, right, I'm going right, right. to have I'm going to have different sentiments on, on what you're doing. So with with Colin Kaepernick, with Colin Kaepernick, it's uh, does he want to burn it all to the ground or does he does he love it and want it want it to want it to improve? So that's that's my concern. Right, right, right. But uh, yeah, we can actually well, it, we can actually look at some stuff and see and uh, and see what we think. That'd be that. good. And, and I'm going to add to it, too. Now, now, a lot of people might I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying that, you know, when we think about like what makes what makes America different from you know some third world country like i'll just i'll say like rwanda or something like that you know I, I was held at gunpoint in 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 africa back in like 2004 right and one of the things i was i was in kenya at the time so one of the things i was thinking about as it was going on I was like man i'm not in america right now you know what makes an america different from a place where you know in over here if there's a political dispute you go vote a person out mm -hmm. and some of these other countries they're coming out with hatchets and, and machetes and, and people are losing arms you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying I think that one of the things that makes America different is that there are, are and actually you addressed this in, in the um, the police video you did about cops. Mm -hmm. You know, there are mean, there are channels that people can go through to vent their frustrations, mm -hmm. right? I think if somebody, no matter how much you think is a, a disgrace or whatever, if people are in a nonviolent mode 
voicing their frustrations, I say let them do it. Mm -hmm. if, if if it's legal and and you know uh, for the most part, you know, like I said, legal and and nonviolent, let them do it. You know what I'm saying? Because I would much rather have that. Yeah. Than than rioting, looting, looting, and and uh, violence in the streets. You know what I'm saying? I think that we have to honor. You know, America has a has a great tradition of of allowing the voice of dissent to speak. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that allows our nation to, you know, fare a lot better than some other nations. I mm -hmm. think that we have to be careful not to remove that just because somebody, you know, cancel culture, mm -hmm. right? We have to be careful not to cancel that out. Yeah, and that, that is an issue that, that keeps coming up um, in that right now everyone's being canceled over, and this goes back to how we how we started. We were, talk, we we're talking about Nick Cannon. And if you say, well, you said some, you said these things and they're messed up. You said some messed up stuff and then we're going to crush you and, and end your career. If you haven't really changed his mind or changed anyone who shares those views minds, all you've done is silence them. And notice that you, on, on the one hand, you can have people who have stupid ideas, but they're allowed to put their stupid ideas out there for public criticism and discussion uh, versus people who have stupid ideas and they have to bottle, they have to keep them bottled up because they'll be crushed if they bring those out there. And the tendency, right, right, right. the tendency now is you have to crush the people and hope that the problem goes away. Well, the problem doesn't go away. They just realize they can't talk about it. Those are the people who, and I'm not talking about Nick Cannon in particular here. Uh, he, he he's, 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 he's set for life. Um, I'm talking about other, other, other people, whatever, whatever position they actually have once the, the, historically in the United States, one of the, one of the great aspects of Western civilization, as we know it now has been that the default, the default method, when you have a disagreement is to settle it through discussion, discourse, debate, things like that, right? You talk about it and try to prove your, try to prove your case. If you remove that if you do away with that you're not allowed to say something that disagrees with me that you're not you're not changing people's views you're just going to change their methods of getting what they want and they're not going to yeah, sure. they're not yeah. going to put their view out there for public scrutiny to see where it leads they're going to they're going to turn to other methods of getting what they want and there's going to be bloody oh, horrible I'm tell you like, mm -hmm. from personal experience like if if somebody's a racist and and they just if they let it be known then I'm like you know what hey Cool. I appreciate it. You know, at least, at least I know where you stand. I'm just not going to mess with you. You know what I'm saying? You know, it, it's the ones that are that are racist and they keep it bottled up and hidden. Those are the ones that you have to watch out for. Yeah. Those are the ones that are going to screw you over and kind of do stuff behind your back. But if somebody is racist and you let me know what it is, hey, all right. Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I know where you are. You know where I am. And, and we good. You know? Yeah, I would I would but, almost uh, I would almost I would almost be in favor of something like uh I never watched the movie, but I, I understand the plot line of the purge, where apparently there was like one, maybe one day out of oh, yeah, one yeah, day one out day, of the yeah. year when all crime was legal and you could go out and just go on a killing spree. So not with crime, but kind of with any view you you have. Like there's there's a day where you can all you can all get up and say any ridiculous thing <laughs> that you want, and we'll we'll have we'll have some we'll have some quick arguments about it, but we're not going to hold you responsible the next day, right? Uh, right, 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 right. So just you know, you know say, what happened? Say if, any if ridiculous thing. Life. Go ahead, go ahead. If that was real life, you know what Vocab Malone would do? Like, you know, he would, uh, oh, shoot, you know what? Never mind. I don't want to mention this job on the air. That's right. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, that's wrong with you. <laughs> trying uh, to get both. So on trying that to get day, Adam, fired. you can tell everyone why you were a Redskins <laughs> fan. Um, <laughs> I caught myself. All right, a couple more. So, so no, notice what's going on here. So, so Robert B. earlier. So, this was back when we were talking about the Redskins. He's going, "You're strong man. You're strong manning the position. People don't want the name changed because outrage culture is out of control." That's true. But I think I said I got that. I think I said uh -huh. I don't ever. I think I said I don't ever want to back down from a mob. What we're saying is, you have a bunch of different positions here. This is what I was saying. You have a bunch of different positions. You have people who want to tear stuff down just to tear it down because they want to tear it all down. And that gives them a sense of power. You don't ever want to back down from them. There are people who don't like the name Redskins, not because they're part of outrage culture, but because they find the term offensive. They've been, you know, they've been impacted by the history and they just find it a... They find it distasteful. Why can't you choose a name that isn't uh, that isn't upsetting to us? That right. makes perfect sense to me. And, and notice, notice because here, here, uh, here, Sarah, Sarah commented right after that. She said, "I think I see what David's saying, and I agree. 
It's a balance. Notice the people who are, you guys are SJWs. You guys are left. I saw that earlier. It was a, you, why does David have these left wing extremists yeah. on here? You saw that, right? Okay. Now think about this, guys. I saw that. Guys, yeah, yeah. So notice what's going on here, guys. We're actually pretty balanced on this, right? We're guys who say, right, right, ah, right, right, I see right. this person's perspective over here. I see this person's perspective over there. I see this guy's point. This guy's got a point, but this guy also has a point. And so you've, you've kind of all got a point. Here's, here's, here's our particular view. We don't say everyone has to agree with us. We're kind of in the middle right. on certain issues. But notice, if you go far enough that way, then we are right-wing extremists from your perspective. If you go far enough that way, then we're left-wing extremists from your perspective. Meanwhile, we're sitting here, and, and to be clear, I'm not, I'm not, uh, politically, I'm not in the, on the, on the, in the, in the middle on every issue. Something like abortion, I'd, you, I'd be considered very clearly on the right. On, yeah, right, on, right, on right. a lot of, on a lot of issues, I'd be on one side. Likewise. Um, but uh, on, on this, on, on the issues we're talking about right now, this isn't, this isn't left wing, right? Well, you have people on the left, on the left wing who want to, the fringe, the fringe left, just destroy everything. But that, that's, that's right, right. what I mean. It's, it's, things are so polarized right now that if you say anything that happens to remotely be on the same page, like these people are to destroy everything and to rip it all down. If I say, actually, I see why some people might be a, a, offended by the term redskin, even though that was not the intention. I understand that that has taken on connotations now, and therefore that is a consideration. You just lump everyone right. together with the with the extremists who say burn everything to the ground, right? Guys, you, you got to stop that. It's the, it's the exact same thing that cancel culture is doing, right? It's if you disagree same with thing. me on anything, I lump you together with, with the extremists. And I don't know if you've been watching, but we are not extremists here. We're not, we're not, no, we're no, not no, even no. close I mean, to it. And, yeah. and that that's the funny part about it is because at the end of the day, what should happen is if we if we disagree on something, mm -hmm. you should be able to provide your reasons. I provide my reasons. And hopefully we're able to kind of reason our way together yep. towards something that makes some sense. I mean, that's that's really what should be happening. Like so thus far, I just I just said a second ago, I recognize the South isn't all about slavery. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that, that's not a very leftist thing to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, I talked about how, you know, um, you know, I have, I have a Native American guy who's kind of schooling me on his perspective about the, the name uh, Riskins and why he doesn't want his, um, his you know, uh, Native Americans to be relegated to being just mascots. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, you know, I'm like, you know what, Dad, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I get that. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're taking from different perspectives. And for me, ultimately, it boils down to, I think that, that in, a, in a fallen world, capitalism provides a better framework of economics than any other that, I, that I'm aware of. And from a capitalistic perspective, you know, if some if you've got the, the you know the Washington you know football team, if their product is gonna take a L, take a loss in the public square, then they have two options. Mm -hmm. They can either hold on to the name and take whatever financial repercussions come from it, mm -hmm. or they can change the name. Mm -hmm. Economically speaking, it makes more sense to me if you want to you know maintain a thriving business to change the name. Mm -hmm. I saw to me economically, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Just from a capitalistic standpoint. So there's all these different factors, and this is what real discourse should look like. I think we've almost been um, lulled to sleep by, I think, you know, like social media and just the way that we have such access to information. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we're not, we're allowing the talking heads to do our thinking for us rather than taking our time and working through things uh, in, in ways that make sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, and so here's the, here's, I think, the legitimate, <laughs> the legitimate concern of the people who are uh, here's what I think the most legitimate concern is of the people who are who are disagreeing with us on, on, on this point, on something simple like the, the Redskins. Again, my position, I don't really care. If you want to change your name, what the heck? It's, it's a team. It's a, it's a business. Change your name. You can change your, you change your name to anything you want. I, don't, I just don't care. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not offended by the term Redskins. Doesn't doesn't bother me. But I understand I'm not the only person in the world and that other people have, have different views. Here's the legitimate concern of people who are disagreeing with us. And no, you can never, you can never change the, the name. Um, their concern is it, it isn't simply that you know the Redskins are changing the name, but it's in response to something that's going on right now, and the the legitimate concern that they have is we 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 know that there's no there is no here's here's what we want and now we're done with the with the mob that wants to wants to to tear everything down and change it right you give them an right. inch they want five inches you give them five inches they want a foot you give them a foot they want thirty feet there's there's no stopping so if you right, back right, right. It, what I think the legitimate concern is no you have to and and I, I might I might actually be in favor of 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 this position on a lot of issues is no even even if they're somewhat right you don't back down from this group on this issue. If later on, mm -hmm. when everything is calm and people come forward and say, these are our concerns, 
and you agree with them, then you can change something. You don't back down from this mob that's doing it because this mob is not going to stop. As soon as you, the more you, hmm. the more you change to appease them, the more power they feel and the more weakness they sense, the more blood they, they sense in the water and the more they come after you, you're, you're simply empowering them. So, you know, if, if someone could actually pull it off, I, I might be in, in favor of a position that says, here are a bunch of things that we are not changing in response to this mob right now. If someone wants to come along af afterwards, then that's that's something else. But not not, you know, we're not changing what Antifa, what Antifa wants, even if even if they happen to even if they're clinging to some other movement that is right and has a legitimate point. This mob needs to go away before we actually uh, can sit down and, and deal. See, with this, this is interesting. I, I hadn't really thought about it this way. I'm just going to toss this out. So. So you're right in the sense that I don't think you can separate the um, say let's say it's called the problems being raised from the people that are raising the problem. You know what I'm saying like there's some interaction there, you know. And I, I remember um, the great Ravi Zacharias, man. I'm not I don't know if this necessarily goes back to him, but I, I mean I, he's the one I heard say it um, is that you 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 got to consider intent. I want to say he says it's kind of like it's prior to content or something like that. You have to, or at least you have to consider That's intent mm -hmm. along with the content, right? Mm -hmm. And so it could be the case that somebody is, um, you know, raising, you know, the content of what it is that they're saying is, you know, maybe right or, or let's just say it's arguable. But if their intent is malicious, then that does have to be considered along with what you do with mm -hmm. the content, yep. at least. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that's an interesting point. And, and, and you're right. I do think that there are, um, that, put it this way, I could say I think that. Uh, the, you know the Robert E. Lee statue should come down in, in public places, and I, and I just mentioned why in terms of who, you know what it represents, public spaces versus private, and so forth. A person from Antifa could say, "I think that Robert E. Lee should be torn down in you know, public spaces," and I mean something like my intent is very different from and that person from Antifa. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because their interest is, I mean, if not anarchy, something pretty close to it. You know, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the content might be the same, but yeah, you're right. The intent is, is, is very different. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do think that thoughtful people, I think you're probably right about that, that, that we have to consider, okay, well, what are we going to do with this information? What are we going to do uh, with this problem that's being raised? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. I'll take uh, this last little comment here because uh, I think it sums up that I think a lot of the disagreement, a lot of the disagreement, well, a lot of the disagreement comes from people who don't really see, can't see anything from anyone else's perspective. Um, so that's one. And then uh, here's another example of, of people just misunderstanding what we're saying. So holy moly's. All right. If I could just let you guys do those last couple ones on your own. I need to I need to get yeah, out go, of here. You're, guys. Yeah, I, no one likes you anyway. I'll yeah. Catch you later, all right. Sub subscribe to the channel. Yeah, the, link is, out, the, God link, bless. the link to vocab's channel is in the description box, everyone. And uh, right, so right, peace. last comment here. Holy moly's donut shop says, uh, I love you guys content. But by your logic, you have to stop doing your parody videos. So notice here. Notice here the misunderstanding. Holy moly's donut shop here must have must have interpreted us as saying, must have interpreted us as saying, if something hurts someone's feelings, then you need to stop or tear it down. If you're if what you're doing is hurting someone's feeling, and therefore if a statue is hurting someone's feelings, then you need to tear it down. And if your team name is hurting someone's feelings, then you need to take it down. But your guys' parody videos are hurting people's feelings, and therefore you need to stop them. Um, no, <laughs> not not what we're not what we're saying. Not what we're saying at all. Right? This is the this is the United States of America. You have every right to criticize and mock things that are that are uh, deserving of criticism and mockery. Um, and when we go through Islam and our you know the parody videos we make, we are deliberately making fun of things that are stupid and need to be made fun of. That is very different from naming your team something that now, even though it may not have originally been this way, but now at least is offensive to a lot of people. If your intention is to mock them because they are worthy of being mocked and deserve to be mocked, well, that would be one thing. But you're a team, you're, you're, your, your intention is not to mock. The intention of that team name has never been to mock. So if people are offended by that and your goal and you're not trying to offend them, then if it's enough people who aren't simply resp responding in an outrage culture, then that's something you should be listening to. If you have a statue that is celebrating Robert E. Lee, well, if your intention were for some reason to mock people, you know, if you if you wanted to build it 
to mock people for some reason that would be that would be one thing but it's not it's not it's there it's there to celebrate it's it's there to honor robert e lee and so if that's your intention the question is what why are you doing that and is that something people want to support that's very 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 different from this is extremely silly and we want to mock this and we want to we don't care if people get offended by this because this needs to be said even if it hurts people's feelings those are complete that, those are completely different uh different situations there all right, uh, final thoughts on, on any of... Well, actually, can I say well, something on that right quick? You can totally say... I mean, so, you, you know, to your point, too, so the other... Yeah, I've mentioned it like three times now, but, you know, the, the Native American gentleman that I was talking to, he was kind of schooling me on his perspective about, you know, the Washington name, you know, so I'm kind of able to glean from that and, you know, you know, broaden my understanding and make some more informed decisions. In your case, you know, dealing with uh, Muslims, right? You've been able to communicate with, with former Muslims, you know, people who are engaged in your work and so forth, and be like, man, you know what, actually, and, and I, I learned this from you, that, you know, when you have somebody who, fr from a, a Arab or Muslim background, they believe that, the, you know, the harder you go for something, that that's indicative that you really believe it, that you have this strong conviction, you know what I'm saying? So how you come across really matters. And so for them, you know, some of the, you know, some of the former Muslims, I'm sure you have many emails to prove it, but like, yeah, no, you, you're going about it the right way, right? So, you know, it's, it, again, it's, it's not that you want to have, like, some sort of situational ethics type of a thing. But at the same time, it, it does matter in terms of who it is that you're dealing with and what the intent is behind what it is that you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Like Jesus told, you know, the woman, uh, I, I think she was a Phoenician woman, was like, yo, you know, you're, you're a dog. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm -hmm. he, he referred to her as a dog. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Now, of course, I mean, he, he was God. I mean, you know, I'm sure he, well, I'll just, I'll just leave the theological aspect of that. But he elicited a response from her that was faith-filled, right? You know what I'm saying? Now, ultimately, you know, he didn't do her any harm by making that statement. You know, likewise with John the Baptist, he referred to people as brood of vipers, mm -hmm. right? He didn't do them a disservice in doing that. He was just calling out their behavior. So there, you can be offensive mm -hmm. and not sinful, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that you know people, people just need to go ahead and take that into account. But then yep. again, this is why we have these discussions so mm -hmm. that we can really, um, you know, work our way through some, some of these important nuances. Yeah, and, right? and and what what's interesting is just that you know how many people misinterpreted things in the same way. Look here, here you have how is David cookies in the breast milk wood really up here talking about not offending people <laughs> i am guys i am totally up for offending people if you're supposed to be offending them right if there's something that you right, need right, to be right. offended over right if it's a and, and look right. look check, check this out check this out robert b again here says the intent was not racist so he's on the redskins again the intent was not racist suck it up buttercup that's the fact <laughs> that matters notice notice robert b's position here all that matters is your intent nothing else matters so so just imagine adam imagine oh. you come from another country where the n-word means something completely different from what it means here because it's a different language and suppose you name your your sports team the uh you know the the such and such n-words and then your team moves to the united states where that has a different meaning according to robert b your intention was not bad and therefore you should never change your name even though everyone from that time on is gonna is gonna you know hear, hear yeah, your actually, team I, name I got, a, hmm? I got a funny story about that a real life story that could be real quick with you yeah, so i was flying back as a matter of fact i think i was flying back from um from south carolina uh, we was up there recently right so i'm flying back home right actually this is my i was coming back from nebraska so I'm sitting next to this guy. He's a Christian and everything, older gentleman. And, you know, we strike up a conversation. I realize, you know, he knows the Lord. And, you know, and we have a great conversation, man. He's a you know, Caucasian gentleman. And we're just talking about stuff, right? And he's telling me he's like some kind of missionary or something like that. And he's showing me some pictures of people that he met, you know, from his missionary work and so on and so forth. And there was this one guy, um, there's a, a, well, I guess we refer to him as white, but he was from Prague or something like that. You know, and I guess we would. You know, if some, you saw him on the street, you probably would think that he was a white dude. Now, this guy's probably about 15, 16, or whatever. And in Prague, he loved Martin Luther King. I guess he got a hold of some Martin Luther King literature and, you know, loved Martin Luther King. And so somehow he ends up in America, you know, with this group, with this missionary group. And they were doing a salute to different historical figures. He wanted to do something for Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And so he decided to, to paint his face and skin black. You know, mm -hmm. and, and and perform that. You know, that I have a dream speech. You know, mm -hmm. at, the, at this thing. And so the dude is like, "Yeah, see." And, and the guy shows me the picture. He's like, "Man, what do you what do you think about this? This is all right, right?" And I'm like, eh. mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, I, you know, I, his intent wasn't to be offensive, yeah. but in this context, that probably wasn't the best idea. Yeah. Now, did he mean anything about it? No. You yeah. know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be mad at the guy. But that's where that's a that's an educational opportunity where you say, you know what, I understand what you meant by yeah. it. 
But you probably ought not to go about it by honoring Dr. King in that particular way, by putting on blackface or something. Yeah, so so that yeah. that's a situation. That's a situation where you can say your intent matters. Your intent matters. It does matter. Yeah. Right, right, so right, right. if we know what your intent right. is, your intent was to insult versus your intent was to honor. Either way, you did something offensive. Yeah, we definitely take your your uh, your intent into account. But it's, it's, yeah, it's not right. all that matters, right? You do have to be aware if you're doing something that yeah. has uh, that you know that has uh, an impact on people that you're not aware of, or that people are going to interpret it right. in, in a way that you you didn't intend. Uh, Robert B. apparently thinks that doesn't matter, and so if you had a team that came here from a different place and it was named the N Words, uh, he thinks nope, you just keep it. And who cares about anyone else? The only person who could ever find it distasteful would be a radical SJW. SJW. <laughs> these guys, these guys are hilarious because funny, these are like you know the, the, these guys have the same mindset as like Antifa. Anyone who disagrees with me about anything, I must I must destroy it and complain about it. <laughs> well, I mean, and the thing is, and maybe uh, one one extra nuance we could add, and I think what we mean is you don't want to offend people unnecessarily i mean like you know just do it just because yep. you know what i mean mm -hmm. i mean it's i think that's that's kind of where people are coming yeah. from you know, where, where we're coming from yeah maybe. all right so to uh, good, to uh to uh i'll just say two things here uh at, at the end um and then and then you can give your 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 final thoughts adam um but on the on the issue of race my goodness this should be obvious to every kid i understand that you know our brains are sort of wired to put people in categories and stuff like that. And there are categories, you know, they're even, they're e the easily, the easiest categories to put people into are like male and female, um, black, white, things like that. Th those are, those are easier for the, you know, the mind to get around. Uh, but then to go and, you know, base your, your worldview on some of those distinctions, the, the, I mean, of all the things that you could base your, your worldview and your concerns about the world on that the amount of melanin, we have the same, we have the same, we have the same substance in our skin. It's melanin, right? And yeah, some people yeah, have yeah. more melanin, and so they're darker brown, and some have a little bit of melanin, and so they're light skin. And some people are in the middle to say, yeah, that's our, you know, that's that's how we're going to set up our worldview based on based on those distinctions. Uh, I'd say that's uh, it's just it's it's completely moronic. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, early on, I talked about how how this is being how people are being manipulated based on this, right? You have various groups that want to divide up people. Um, you know, you have white supremacists and white nationalists who want, you know, want to, want to keep people separate. You also have, you also have people from other groups that want to keep, want to keep people separated. This is kind of your last, last stand right now, at least in, at least in the West, because people are becoming so mixed up that 40, 50 years from now, it, 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 it's it's impossible, right? You're gonna you're gonna have a total spectrum. You're gonna have dark on one side, light on one side, and you're just gonna have degrees in the middle. You're gonna have everything in between. It's very hard at that point to say, all right, we're gonna separate people based on race. So the people who are really really want to keep people divided, this is kind of their last chance. But I'll say this: there are other people who, if your political movement is if you sort of draw your power of your movement from racial tension and racial division, because you're the group that's supposedly going to go and solve all of these problems, sometimes it's not actually in your best interest to solve those problems because that's where, that's where you draw your support and, and strength from. So I just want everyone to be aware that when someone is coming to you saying, hey, I'm the, I'm the group that solves this problem, so support me, and they're the same people that are stirring up the tension the most. Just be be very proceed cautiously. And I'm I'm not. This is not just one group. Everyone does this, right? Everyone has everyone's group is the group that's going to fix that problem and protect you. Well, you need to we need to watch that because notice. Think about this. We we talked about this earlier. How you know at uh, my wife's parents' generation, they were the first generation that could marry, that could have an interracial marriage. They passed the law and they got married. Um, here you have, so they got married, they were a mixed race couple. Now you get to the level of the grandkids and we, we have, again, we have three races at the family cookouts. We have black, white, and Asian all at the same cookout. That is lightning speed for change in a society. So think about that. If things are changing that rapidly from the grandparents were not allowed to get married until the law changed until now when all the races are being are being mixed together that is lightning speed if you're looking at that you're thinking 
wow, a generation or two from now, we're going to be so mixed up. It's going to be hard to, you know, be that delighted. If your political movement, if your political movement, if your political system, if you're the group that draws its strength and support from racial tensions, this is kind of your this is kind of your last your last chance to 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 jump into action because guess what 20 30 years from now if no if no one's if no one's really upset because we don't have we don't have these black white this that if you don't have that anymore then what's the what's the need for your group anymore and you should be in panic mode we either have to completely take over right now or we might not get the we might not get a chance 10 10 20 years from now so whatever the group is Whatever the group is that's saying, I'm going to solve your problem, always, always, because, you know, we, we, we do want to solve problems. We do want our leaders, we vote people into power because we believe they're going to fix problems, but always be on the lookout for people who are really trying to solve the problem and people who want to stir up the problem because they're the ones you turn to when you're concerned about the problem. So just make sure that the people you choose are doing what you want them to do and not the opposite of what you want them to do because they want to make you more dependent on them. So those are my thoughts. My, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just against people being manipulated by our leaders and by the media and, and by everyone else. So uh, those are my thoughts. Adam. Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, so um, I'm going to say out front that I think that one of the biggest problems that we have today is that the that Christians I'm saying have abdicated their place they, they've they've evacuated from the public square in, in terms of starting from biblical axioms starting from a biblical position on what it is that's going on in the world and bringing what we have in the within the biblical worldview to the public square to say okay now this here's here's what the answers are rather than that we've actually been like the caboose right we've actually been kind of playing catch up whereas people in the world are framing all these issues for us and then we're trying to make sense of it from a biblical lens we had it backwards you know what i'm saying i think what we need to be doing is and this is why this is why my issue i, I have nothing against you know nick cannon personally but for me he's he's an influencer who's putting bad ideas out there mm -hmm. right and we need to be about the business of um confronting bad ideas mm -hmm. i'm saying i'm unapologetically um proud to be a christian i'm unapologetically proud to be and African American. Mm -hmm. See, this is what, this is how God made me. He he placed me within this context, mm -hmm. and I think that that means something. I, and I have a responsibility then to exemplify the best of what the gospel is within this context. Now, for me, what that means is when I see ideas coming in that would destroy that, then you know that are anti-biblical. I've got to confront it. Right. This is what we ought to be doing. You know what I'm saying? This is actually I think it's a living out of the second commandment. Right. If I love somebody. If I love my neighbor and I see that there are worldviews and ideologies that people are being uh, subjected to that are anti um, their well-being, if I love that person, I'm going to I'm going to do something about it. Right. I'm going to confront it with truth. And so I think that's what we need to be about. And the other side of it is, too, is I think that conversations like these need to happen more. Like mm -hmm. we need to have Christians talking these things out in public. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to have. And because th this is the best op this right here is the best opportunity that our country has to ever get over whatever this is, you know, in regards to race, racism, and what have you. This right here is the best opportunity we have. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, like, you know, Dave, I just I just met you, um, I guess it's been like maybe two, two, two and a half years ago now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, we, we don't come from the same background. We don't come from the same place, but we're two brothers in Christ, right? Obviously, have different melanin counts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Different cultural experiences who are able to come together and talk these things out, mm -hmm. right? Because we have this overarching unity in Christ, and we're willing to submit our, ide our ideas to reason, truth, and reason, right? This is this is the best opportunity that our country has, mm -hmm. right? And so, without that, without Christians stepping up and saying, "Hey, this is what the biblical ethic looks like. Here's how it plays out in the real world. This is what we ought to um, hold our society to." Without Christians doing that, then there is no hope for our mm -hmm. society. I'm saying Christians have to take the lead. We got to stop, you know, uh, being that caboose. Mm -hmm. And so. You know, that's my thing, man. So, you know, yeah, I talk a lot about this stuff, you know, my channel, you know, True ID Apologetics. Y'all definitely check me out. That's T R U I D Apologetics. And um, you know, that yeah, that's all I got, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh guys, just uh just think about think about our 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 history here. Um had a big civil war over an issue, fought, uh, got past it, got past it, moved forward, made things better. 
Um, women couldn't vote. Had big disputes over that. Fixed it. Got better. Had segregation. Got past it. Got better. The system is designed to improve. Whereas uh, right now, right now you have people pushing further apart. In fact, uh, in fact, as far as like uh, Congress and so on, this is the most, the, the recent statistics are that this is the most polarized the United States has ever, the United States uh, Congress has ever been, right? And so this, this record was set under Trump. The record broke an earlier record under Donald Trump, which broke an earlier record set under the, under the administration of Barack Obama. Mm. And if you look at the, the, most, the most polarized the United States has been since the since the since the early 1900s, the most polarized has been under Donald Trump, Barack Obama, George W. Bush. And what wow. that what that means is it's not simply the leader. It's just society as a whole is becoming more polarized. And so, guys, just, I, I can't emphasize this enough. When someone says something you disagree with, I understand if someone is a lunatic or if someone is is just a horrible person you have to you you have to just say no you're a horrible you're a horrible person trying to destroy everything no I'm not listening to you right when someone simply has something you know a view that you disagree with try to get your minds around why that person thinks that way and whether that person has a point even if at the end of the day you disagree with the person's uh you know with the outcome that's what that's what will help and so you know at the end of the day we have these various banners that we can unite under. We can say, hey, we disagree, but we're Christians. Um, we disagree, but we're Americans, right? And so we, we, we have to be... And to put a scripture to it, be slow to speak and quick to listen. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so I, I agree with you, Adam, that, I mean, this is the, this is the time, right? The, the, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at, th this is the most polarized we've, we've, uh, we've been since the, since, the, since the early 1900s. Guess I mean, you, we look around, and I think what what's driving a lot of the uh, the anxiety and so on is just it looks, you know, if you are at all, if you love America, you see it being leveled, right? And if you hate America, you want it to be leveled, and so you have these like diametrically opposed positions and so on, and they're just pulling everyone, we're pulling every, they're pulling everyone to the extreme. But guess what? If we can actually get past that, well, that's that that's great, right? That's great. See, if, yeah, if, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. if we get. And if we can't, then then we are we are we're just totally screwed. We're, we're doomed. Right? Yeah. So, I, but I, I agree with Adam that we should uh we should we should be discussing this issue. So so Adam, maybe we'll start maybe we'll start getting together with the with the with the crew and uh, start discussing all yeah, yeah, of yeah. the all the most controversial issues of the week. <laughs> right. Right. By, by the end of it, we'll all be Marxist yeah. and, and, and yeah, and and Kyle Hitler and all that. And yeah. what what's cool is even the people in the in the in the chat who are flipping out. I can't believe, David, you criticize Islam. I thought you agreed with me on everything. How could you disagree with me on this? What's cool is maybe people will start to get past that. And hey, I agree with you on these three things and I disagree with you on these two on these two things, but we agree on some important things and so we can disagree on these things. Maybe we can get to that point. And I think that would, right, right, I right, think right. That would be cool. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks to Adam. And uh, j just by the way, everyone, Adam's uh, link to Adam's channel is in the description box. Link to Vocab's channel is in the description box. Link to John McRae's uh, channel uh, in the description box. Um, we're all friends, and uh, yep, we get together when we can, have discussions like this, and so check out their channels. And especially, uh, again, they they all just posted a they, they all recently posted a video on uh, on the on the the Nick Cannon on the Nick Cannon issue. And so I'm sure we'll all be posting more stuff because. The issues never stop. They just keep coming. Right. All right. right, right so right. till next time, catch y'all later. Hey.